All right. Uh, welcome to the uh, August 6th Northampton School Board. As chair of the Northampton School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to the executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there's no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are, one, providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the Northampton School Board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting throughout this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary participate in this meeting through dialing the following phone number 646-876-9923 or by clicking on the link which is located on the SAU 21 website. <clears throat> Two, providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing this meeting including how to get Access to the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. Instructions have also been provided on the website of SAU 21 office at www.sau21.org. <clears throat> Three, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please call 603-926-8992, extension 103, or email revans at sau21.org. Four. Adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member uh, is called, state their, state their presence, please. Also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required by the right to know law. We will now take a roll call. Aaron Stanton. Here, uh, family in and out. Greg Duffy. Uh, present with family in and out. Martin Tavishian. Nermina Peterson. Here with family. And Tom Von Jeff. Present alone. I have the roll call. Okay, so we are going to start our meeting today with an agenda item uh, around staff and presentations. Over the past year, uh, one of the school, school board's goals was to find ways to integrate uh, what's going on in the school to the public a little bit more effectively, uh, especially in this past year where uh, things have been a little bit more online and in, uh, in computer and Zoom calls. So um, we are trying to bring some of the good things that are going on at uh, Northampton School, which there are plenty of, and tonight we have Marcia Zavez here to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and Sue, I'm sorry if I preceded any intro that you also might have had for that. So uh, feel free to chime in if you would like. Actually, Becca was going to give the introduction. Oh, Becca, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Mr. Duff. Sorry. Fine. You can Any, find anyone, over who's going to introduce me. It's okay. <laughs> anyone who wants to introduce Marsha, feel free. <laughs> So Marsh is not only our extraordinary art teacher here, but she's also the director of our musical. And so she is here to share with us some information about our um, 2019, um, 2020, sorry, spring musical, The Little Mermaid. And she has some students that are here that she'll be introducing to help with this. Yay, all right. Um, so the first thing I'll say before I let the kids um, join in is um, it, it, it the musical's been going on for years. I've been um, involved in some way for the past 20 years. It's a great thing that happens at our school. It involves a ton of kids, um, grades six, seven, and eight. Um, at one time I had over 80 kids in the cast and it's just a, it's just a fun thing for everybody. Um, and this year was a little different because we had, we had all our rehearsals going. We had the sets being, you know, almost well, on the way to being built. We had, practices and then at March 13th we had to just stop everything. Um, we thought we were coming back in a couple of weeks and then we kept pushing the date maybe we can perform in June and maybe we can perform when in the summer but it didn't work out. So we've been we were really flexible and um, I was asked to see if there was something I could do as far as getting the show out to the public. So what I did is I took 
some of the rehearsal videos that we had. I took, um, so I had Zoom calls with a bunch of the cast members where they could read parts of the script. And I had some of the kids record themselves at home singing solos and whatnot. And I ended up putting the whole thing together as an iMovie. Um, and it was, it came out to fun. I mean, the kids, it, they didn't get to perform for an audience, but I think what happened was still something really fun and people got to see it. And um, it was just, you know, you got to be flexible in these, in these times. And in the arts, that's kind of what we do. We are flexible all the time and we're always using our imaginations and creativity to come up with something new and different and exciting. So this worked out, the kids had fun. Um, I'd love them to talk a little bit about um, either what it's been like to be in plays in the past at our school, what it was like this year that it was a little bit different, if they had fun, if they learned anything, um, what they took away from it. Um, and then if you want me to speak about um, what we might have to do this coming year, I have a couple of ideas, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm hoping to do a full-blown spring musical in April or May or whenever. Um, but if we can't do that, which I understand, who knows what's going to happen? Nobody does. Um, I have a, a couple of things that we could probably do to make something happen again. Um, so I'd love to hear from any of the kids. I, I see you got Tegan and Cam who are sort of, or I see their names anyways, who are with us. And I know there's some Duffies hanging around. I can unmute. I can unmute these two. There's yeah, also is, somebody else that I'm looking for. If he could raise his hand. Oh, Ben. Oh, yes. Is ben, ben, if you're there, raise your hand. His hand is up. Oh, I, I see him now. Whoops. Here he is. Cameron is up there, and Ben is up there. I think that's it. Jesse couldn't make it. Um, Yes, we just have, we should have the five. Okay. And then I also, um, we, I put together a little mini video, just uh, six minute to show you um, little pieces of the, the big movie that we did. The big movie is an hour and something. And um, so this is just a little six minute montage that we'll show you after just to, sh to give you a little bit, a little taste of what the movie was like. Um, but either, Ben or Cam or Tegan, either one of you. I'm, also, I'm sorry, I'm on a spinny chair. I can't. <laughs> it's hard not to spin on a spinny chair. Um, who, any, who wants to talk first? Just anything? Talk first. All right, all right, Cam, go ahead. So I wrote up a little something that I wanted to say about like all of the past musicals and including this one. Um, so hello, I'm Cameron Stanton, a past eighth grader at, um, at NHS. Looking back at middle school, the play is definitely one of the standout events um, that I was part of each year. As a younger student going to musicals and seeing the previews on opening night, you see it as a big kid event and something that you would love to be a part of when you're able. When I became a sixth grader, I realized what an actual community the play is. Everyone was included, not just the actors and the actresses, but the creative artists that can make incredible sets and the people that just wanted to be a part of it could help move sets and list curtains as well. The experience was priceless and I wouldn't ever want to change any of it. Thanks, Cam. Thanks. All right, um, Ben, you want to say something? Okay, in a minute. Sure, um, <laughs> for the uh, one play that I've been part of was super fun for um, sixth grade. Uh, oh, hi, I'm Ben and I'm going into eighth grade. Um, for the first play that I was part of, it was really fun, even though I didn't have a big role. And for this one, I got a bigger role and I was super looking forward to it. And I understand that the thing had to get canceled because of COVID-19, but it was really disappointing. But the movie you put on was really good, Mrs. Avis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, I really was hoping to be able to be part of the play, but I wasn't able to because of COVID, mm -hmm. but I was also hoping that I could continue my school year into eighth grade to do the play. So if we could go back to school, I would love to enjoy the play for my last year in eighth grade. <laughs> A little plug from Ben. <laughs> okay. 
Well, you know what, some way, I don't know how it's gonna happen, Ben, but we're gonna, a play is gonna happen in some form or fashion for your eighth grade year. You can count on that from me. Um, and what about Tegan? Uh, Tegan, are you still, th are you there? Hi, um, my video isn't working. Oh. Sorry, I don't know That's why. okay. Um, my name's Tegan, oh, there we are. Um, I- Oh, there she is. And what I really liked from the play was how it was everybody. It wasn't just seventh graders. I got to know sixth graders and eighth graders because scenes weren't just my grade. Like I got to do partner work and different scenes with the sixth graders and eighth graders. So I really liked making new friends in different grades. Nice. Thank you. All right. And um, Duffy boys. I'll go. Okay. Um, hello everybody, my name is Oliver Duffy and I was a past 8th grader in the play production. I was very sad to hear that the play wasn't going to be like going on due to COVID and I was thrilled to hear that Mrs. Zabez was pulling together like an online production of some sort. Um, out of my years doing the play, I'm going to miss meeting people and making new relationships with the cast members of the other grades. I'll be moving on and continuing the music theater department at Winnicunit like my older brothers, but most of all, I will miss my dear producer, my dear producer and art teacher, Mrs. Zavis. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll miss you too, Ollie. Uh, hello, my name is Solomon Duffy <laughs> and I am entering seventh grade. This past year would have been my first year participating in the school musical, The Little Mermaid. I was a made-up role Chef Huey, which was <laughs> Both were comedy roles and we had a blast. I am the youngest of four brothers who have all been in the musicals during their sixth, seventh, and eighth grade years. So I have seen all the past productions and cannot wait to be part of it myself. I was bummed when we had to cancel the live musical, but super happy that Ms. Salvas put together an online version. I'm really looking forward to my seventh and eighth grade years and being part of the future productions. This is Sully Duffy signing off. <laughs> and Sully made up role. You were so good, I had to write something in for you. So that's that's an honor. <laughs> um, the plays. Sully, so he, he reminded me of something. The kids that come to watch the shows, they come and watch when they're um, like in kindergarten and first grade and second grade. And then they just wait and wait and wait until they can be in sixth grade to be in the show. And it's, it's a school-wide event. It's, it's um, something that's treasured at, at NHS and um, just it's something that everybody can enjoy. So you guys, thanks so much for, for speaking. And now you've got to stick around because you want to you wanna watch. I, I put a little montage together. So hopefully that will work. So I, I've got that. So I'm going to okay. share my screen and we're going to keep our fingers crossed that the video stream is the way it's supposed to. But many thanks to Marsha for all of her hours. I and mean, when you think of all the hours that it takes to put together <laughs> a play in person, it takes even more hours to put together a, a video version during a pandemic. So um, the, the, the complete version, like she said, was over an hour long. Mm -hmm. This is the highlight reel. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen and, and let's, okay. let's hope the technology gods shine upon us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Marsha. We love everything you do for oh. our, our drama program. It wouldn't be the same without you. You really make Thank it special for the kids. Thank you. You know what, it's, when you love what you do, it's, it it's comes through, I guess. It oh, does. There it is. Ready?
Hello? Somebody has got to nail that ghost feels to the floor. <laughs> Good job, you guys. Um, it was, it's a little slower, you know, it was a little glitchy. It, it, if you watch the whole movie, it runs a lot smoother than that. But um, yeah, the kids all had such a good time. And it's, it's, a, it's a great group, great group of kids. And um, I love, I just love doing it. It's really, really fun. Thank you, Mrs. Zoffman. <laughs> Thanks, Cam. I know I had to cut all your songs. I wanted to leave them all in, all of your little pieces. <laughs> I'm so like, cool. oh, I can't yeah. show the whole thing. I got to make it like five minutes. And to cut everything to, for five minutes was, was not easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Somebody has got to know that goes being stupid. <laughs> and with that. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody has questions about next year or um, anything they want to ask, but... Um, Thank you for actually invite, for inviting us to show what we do and what we love to do and something that's special at Northampton School. Tom, looks like you have a question. I oh. well, have a question, just a quick comment. So first of all, Ben, Cameron, Tegan, Oliver, and Sully, um, first of all, thank you for coming on. You did a great job, not only representing mm -hmm. yourselves, but the entire cast. Um, and as I was listening to each of you, there were a couple things that kept coming up. Community, valuing um, your friends and friendship, creativity, appreciation, and resilience. And I hope you hold on to all those because they're gonna be really important. Um, and then Mrs. Avis, thank you for inspiring um, our students. You do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. They're, they're easy to work with, they're fun to work with, and they love what I love. So, hey, <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. All good. Yeah, I, I echo you, Tom's sentiment. I think this is a great example of when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. And this mm -hmm. was uh, this aired in, did we air it in April? It I, was during school. Yeah, well, it was right. I, I Zoomed everything. The Zooming took a lot longer than I thought, but I didn't finish until right after school finished. So probably beginning of June. Yeah, so yeah. that was great. Right. It was refreshing to get to get some of that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Um, okay. Yeah, and so I you know for next year, if I have to work with small groups and you know record little small groups, or if I can do a whole show, that'd be great. I'm thinking talent show. You know, we're going to have to invent things and be creative for talent shows and all of that. But I think we can still make stuff happen. So thank you so much, and thank I'll you. I'll just thank listen you. for the rest maybe, and <laughs> you can unvideo me. <laughs> We're with you guys 100%, and Ben and Thank Tegan, Ollie, Sully. It looks like you're going to be making lemonade again this year, so let's let's uh, look forward to uh, mixing a new recipe and seeing what we can come up with. So congratulations. Nice job, guys. On Cameron, sorry. I left you out, Cameron. You're hiding in the corner <laughs> of my screen. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions for the kids or Marsha? All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right, we'll move on to our notes, uh, regular meeting notes from June 4th. We have a motion. I make a motion to approve the uh, minutes from June 4. Second. Okay, any um, further discussion on those? No. Okay, uh, roll call vote. Do you need a second? Oh, uh, Aaron seconded. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. The roll call was Aaron Stanton? Yes. Greg Duffy? Yes. Jermina Peterson? Yes. And Thomas Von Jess? Yes. And Martin Tavishian? Yes. I have the vote recorded. Thank you, Rhonda. Our next item is uh, approval of the minutes from the July 15th. Uh, board meeting. I make a motion to approve the minutes from the July 15th special meeting. Second. Aaron Stanton? Yes. Greg Duffy? Yes. Martin Tavishian? Yes. Mina Peterson? Yes. And yes. Abstain. I have the vote recorded. 
Okay, thank you, Rhonda. All right, moving on, number three in the agenda is correspondence and accommodations. Do we have any talk about it? I have, I have, I have um, some. And, okay. Um, also, I think Tracy got bumped out and she needs to get let back in. So, um, the first one is is really commendations for our um, custodial and facility staff. They've been doing an amazing job during the summer of um, not just cleaning, but helping us figure out all of the things that we need to figure out um, to make the school safe, um, signage, um, measuring, ordering items, um, just all kinds of things. So Stu and his crew have been doing a great job with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to do, and I think it might lead into a commendation perhaps that Greg has, and if not, I have it, I have it as backup, but I wanted to just publicly thank Tracy um, for all of her uh, five years at Northampton School. Um, I think everyone who knows Tracy has always been impressed and the things that impressed me, even though I've just been here for one year, I think the number one thing when you get to know Tracy is her love of children. I mean, she just loves every child in that school like nobody's business. And she knows them all. She knows their needs. Um, she's patient. She's kind. She's um, she, she's organized. She um, has a sense of school spirit that permeates um, her, her work in the school. And she is so committed to Northampton School. So I just wanted to publicly thank Tracy and um, wish her the best. And Greg, do, do you have the other piece or do am I the only one that got that? I, I, ha I have something I was planning on saying, but I don't know if it's the other piece that you're referring to. So I, I was copied um, on a letter from James Sununu. Would you like me to read it or do you have it? Oh, I don't, I did not see that, so absolutely. Okay, can I, can I read that then too? So James, yeah. um, James sent a letter to the school board and it says, Dear Northampton School Board, I'm writing to express my gratitude to Tracy Griffinhagen for her service to Northampton School over the last five years. As a board member, I have seen firsthand how her dedication to her work has made Northampton a better, stronger school, especially for those students who have special needs. Over the years, I've spoken with dozens of parents of students with special needs and every last one of them consistently pra praised Tracy's work and the support she gave their children. And as a parent of three former NHS students, I have seen how much she cares about each and every student in the building and takes a personal interest in seeing that every child receives as much support in their education and growth as our school can provide. During my time on the board, Northampton faced significant turmoil and many challenges and Tracy persevered through it all with her dedication to the kids always first and foremost. Change is never easy and and it can be slow to come, but I believe Northampton School has changed for the better in recent years, and Tracy is a big part of that success. She has my utmost respect and admiration, and I wish her all the best in the future. She will be missed. Sincerely, James Sununu. Thanks. That was, well. Wow. I did just see, he sent it at 525, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> chastise him, because I was <laughs> doing some prep work. Uh, but I'm, I'm, um, I have a few comments myself. I'm terribly saddened to see Tracy go, um, but I know that uh, it's, it's a decision that she made uh, for herself and her, and her family first. And we've always talked about family first and doing what's right for yourself. And um, we, wish, we wish you all the best, Tracy. This is definitely a, a little bittersweet, um, you know, We've, as James alluded to, I've known Tracy for six or seven years um, since she started, um, was part of the, the interview committee for her. And I, I will, I'll be honest, I think it took me maybe 20 seconds into her conversation with the committee to uh, want to hire her. Uh, and I marched right out of there right away and said, we have to get this person. And she entered the school um, with focus, she, with dedication, and there's been, as I think a lot of people are aware, it's been a little bit of a tumultuous uh, tenure um, through the last six years. We've been through some superintendents, some assistant superintendents. We've been through some principals. <laughs> One of the consistent things has been Tracy, who has and did, and, and I think it's important to let the community know, and I'm glad there's 109 people on here this time, 
she stood like a rock and never wavered and never put anybody first except for the kids. And it was not an easy task. There were some very trying times during that. I've never saw her act uh, out of character. Uh, she was, is and was professional at every moment through some very difficult times. And I think it's a testament to, to her character and losing that character um, is, a tough, is a tough pill to swallow, but I wish you the best and we'll look for another character to fill. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just want to add one thing that everybody maybe doesn't know at home or even on the board, but Tracy also has a great sense of humor. So, <laughs> so you know, we're, we're able to laugh when, when it's hard to laugh sometimes. So that's thanks to her sense of humor. She's got a funny way of wor with words sometimes. <laughs> that was a very diplomatic way of saying that, and my parents will appreciate you saying it in just that way. <laughs> Your alter ego, Jaggy, right? Maybe. <laughs> Hi, Ashton. Hi. How are you? I'm good. It's nice to see you. And I'll miss you, Mrs. Griffin. <laughs> I'll miss you too, Ashton. Oof. Thank Thanks, you, Aaron. <laughs> He thought this was the last time he could say goodbye, and you've had a real impact on his education. We're gonna miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, Northampton is a, an amazing community, and you know, I think it is very hard to leave, but I, I know you have an incredible administrative team there with Susan and Becca. Um, and you have an incredible staff. I can't imagine working with a more skilled and expertise special education staff. They are phenomenal. I would argue they are the best, you know, in the Seacoast. <laughs> uh, and they are complemented by an extraordinary um, educational associate team as well. Um, we are very fortunate. You all are very fortunate to have uh, that team and it, they will carry on with the same level of expertise and passion uh, whether I'm there or somebody else is there because that's what they do. And um, they've been, it's been an amazing staff to work with. I said at the last parade, I wouldn't have wanted to go through uh, this situation with any other staff. And, and as I've said to the staff, we've come a long way in five years. And that is the hard work and dedication of the board. Um, and certainly our teachers, our, our, uh, the entire staff, um, quite frankly, from our facilities to Paula's team to, uh, to, to the teachers and EAs. So thank you. It's been a real privilege to work in Northampton. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, anyone wanna add anything else? I've got one more um, accommodation, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to say over the course of the summer, there's been a lot of extra work done by the task force, um, the back to school task force, administration, teachers. Um, and uh, I just wanna say thank you for all your work, the extra effort, energy, um, and focus. I know sometimes it's been frustrating, but although it'd be frustrating at times, it doesn't mean you're not appreciated and your work's not appreciated, so thank you. Thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, we move into the next uh, agenda item, which is uh, public uh, comment, questions, and comments from those in attendance. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to just review a couple of things. I, I noticed a large attendance here, and I suspect that there's some commentary. So I just wanted to outline um, kind of the policy up around this. As a board, we, can you not hear me? You're very, very muffled. All right, sometimes All right. you're getting mm -hmm. How's that, is that any better? Much better. Okay, sorry, I'll talk louder too. Um, so we've been, I just wanted to outline a couple of the parameters around uh, public participation in board meetings. A uh, former board meeting once told me it's very peculiar. This is a 
this is not a public meeting, this is a meeting held in public. And so there is a designated time for comments from the audience. Um, and, and there's also uh, sort of a, uh, not an interaction typically between the school board and the audience, uh, because it really is a, a meeting held in public. So there's that moment for, for, just for uh, comments. As a board, we've always operated freely and a little bit more openly. That's one of the things that we strive to do in that we have entertained commentary from the uh, public throughout um, when it's pertinent. Uh, and I think we wanna to continue to do that in the future. However, tonight, I think it's probably pertinent given the amount of people and the topic that we sort of fall back on our policy and set aside the time to hear uh, commentary from the public um, it probably won't be an engagement from the board to the public. Um, I would also ask that people allot um, some time for others to speak. And um, we, we, the policy states 15 minutes in total, but there may be more than that. I'll ask the board if they're in agreement to making sure everybody gets uh, their, their time on the microphone, uh, even if it goes over the 15 minutes. So I'll ask that of the board right now. If they're in agreement, they can just verbally say so. I agree. Agree. Agreed. Okay. Um, and then I think that um, should about cover it. Um, so I'll just ask that uh, how we're going to work this is uh, you, I think there's a, a button that you can raise a hand or, or notify Rhonda and Rhonda will, will take, take you and put you uh, on speaker. And as typical in these meetings, you'll, uh, if you wouldn't mind stating your name, uh, your address. And uh, the other thing I would uh, ask of the board to approve right now is that typically it's, um, it's uh, town residents in a, in a town public meeting that get the opportunity to speak. Uh, we would like to open it up to, I would like to make a proposal that we open it up to, to anyone who, who has a topic regarding the school or has a relationship with the school. Um, there may be parents that live outside of this town um, that have a relationship with the school. So as long as um, we maintain that, then uh, I would be willing to hear uh, what anyone had to say. If the board is in agreement with that, we can just state. Agree. I agree. Agree. Yeah, I don't see why. Sure. Okay. Okay. So I think at this point we'll open it up uh, to the public for comments. And if you have one, uh, you can electronically raise your hand and Rhonda will let you in. I do have um, Anna Spalding had her hand raised. Good, the good kindergarten teacher got her hand up first. <laughs> That's right. Hi. Hi, Anna. Hi, how are you guys? Thank you so much. Um, I wanna read uh, an email that my husband and I drafted this morning. Um, so I want to voice my opinion on the reopening plans. I think we can all agree that we all want the kids and teachers back in school if it is safe and prudent to do that. I think the plan that, you, that has been laid out so far is thoughtful and I support it. We should make a decision as soon as possible so that parents, teachers, and kids can begin to plan for the fall. We cannot pl uh, please all stakeholders and now it's decision time. Let's make it and let's go people need to plan accordingly. Whether it's pre-K to five in person or six to eight in person, it's debatable. To me, the topic is sound enough, reduce the school population on any given day, spread out, et cetera. Um, middle school teachers can be centralized on site for optimized resources and most effective delivery of e-learning and also sharing of best practices. They have very little time to optimize at this point. So initial delivery, could be rougher than if they had more time to plan. Pre-K to five starting off in person makes sense. These kids have a smaller basis for mental toughness, socialization, immunity to germs and receptiveness to e-learning. Get them started in person. Middle school kids can legally be left alone, providing more flexibility. Kids with specific needs can be brought in for in-person small group support, it makes sense. My kids are going into sixth and eighth grade. They would rather be in school with their friends, but they have been raised with the capacity for mental toughness and ability to cope with disappointment or even uncertainty. They'll adjust and to me it's good for them in the long run. We as parents can give them alternative ways to socialize and grow as people. As for in-person learning, beware. There are business stories I've heard from people in town where in-person tr group trainings 
for new employees have severely disrupted, extended, ineffective, expensive, because someone in a pod had a cough or fever, actual COVID, and the entire pod must quarantine for 14 days. This could render in-person learning actually the complete opposite, worse than e-learning if kids and parents are suddenly forced to pivot. That is a real downside for going full person or even partial as much as we want. Teachers wanna teach and they just want to be safe and feel supported and informed of the decision. They also need a plan for the most successful outcomes of whatever format they are asked to take on. They should also not be responsible for kids who are not respect so respecting commonly held best practices for avoiding the spread of COVID. In other lines of work like retail or barber, you follow the rules if you need to leave, um, or you need to leave, excuse me. Teachers don't have that ability in this case. They actually have real liability in these matters with very little control. Um, I support you and I've done a thoughtful, and you've done a thoughtful job collecting stakeholders' opinions and data. We're uh, ready to live with the decision and also support our community and listen openly for those with different opinions with respect. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Anna. We have um, someone by the name of Eric Browning. Hi, Eric. I think you're on mute. You I go. think I muted. Hi, how are you tonight? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Browning. I live at uh, Five Bolters Cove in Northampton. I'd like to comment on the return to school plan. Um, I think first I'd like to commend the committee on the thoroughness and thoughtfulness uh, that you went through to create this plan and, and like to state up front that I do support it. Um, I, like all of you, would like my child to be back in school. I think before listening to the presentation last night, I really didn't fully appreciate all the potential challenges that we would face with reopening, in particular those that faculty and staff are going to be presented with. Uh, we do have four kids, uh, and they actually all attend different schools. And so I've actually seen a lot of different reopening plans. And I'll just say that this was by far the most well thought out plan with exceptional communication from the committee uh, from, you know, really from the time of, of, of the spring all the way through the summer to where we are now, uh, and really appreciate the, the, the explanation of the rationale behind these decisions and the, the specific challenges you're faced with. Um, I think I would just also comment that the schools that, that the other schools that I've seen that in which we are a part of, uh, they have also created detailed plans. Uh, they've carefully considered in-person safety uh, protocols. They're all going planning on being in person, they have plans and scenarios by which they would transition to remote. However, uh, none of them, and I would also include uh, the plan as presented here, has really figured out an appropriate way to manage their quarantine requirements. Um, as already outlined by the SN20, SU21 school board, people are going to stay at home at times and perhaps for some kind of extended quarantine period. Um, it could be teachers, faculty, or students. You know, and if a teacher is out, who's going to cover the class? What if there were a lot of teachers that are out? Who's going to cover that class? And I'm, I'm personally not comfortable. How do we ensure continuity of education in that period? 65% uh, of the faculty and staff had some concern about not coming back. Um, and that's, I think, a very large number that, that cannot be ignored on all this, um, regardless of what we would like it to be. Um, and so for any student that you know, may have to be sent home, even if it's just a normal cold. Um, they may, this in this scenario, have to enter into quarantine. And how will they stay current in that? Uh, that could be incredibly disruptive. Uh, as I mentioned, none of the schools I'm involved with have actually been able to answer this question. Uh, and essentially what they're all saying is that materials are gonna be made available and the student needs to do their best to teach themselves, um, which is really a much worse situation, in my opinion, than uh, where we were in the spring when we went into this emergency mode where, where, where people were, were at home. Um, I think we all want our kids back in school. I certainly do, but um, it isn't practical. I think the wide ranging symptoms dictate that many teachers and students are going to have to frequently quarantine and that's the unfortunate reality of this difficult situation. So I would just urge that the board accept the proposals presented to allow the Northampton team to spend this last month getting ready to open on time and provide that quality education that they've done. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. We 
I'm sorry. We have Andy Wallace. I'm going to allow to talk. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my name is Andrew Wallace. Uh, I, I technically live in South Portland, but uh, as the president of Seacoast Education Association, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, thank you for your work on behalf of students and teachers in SAU 21 in these difficult times. I'm here tonight to represent the thoughts and concerns of teachers regarding the upcoming 2021 school year. The first point I do want to address is one that often gets overshadowed in all this, and that is how much we teachers missed in-person teaching and learning and connecting with our students this past spring. As teachers, this profession is our passion, it's fun, it's rewarding, it's difficult, uh, and it's, exp it's very inspiring. For so many reasons, we can't wait to get back to our classes and students, which brings me to a very different point, the health and safety of our students, their families, this community, and of course, our fellow teachers, our custodial staff, our administrators, our nurses, and our paraprofessionals. Simply put, we are concerned about everybody's safety in the midst of an ongoing pandemic and especially when we're considering putting several hundred to a thousand people together in school buildings. This isn't a theoretical conversation anymore. COVID is already in our schools in New Hampshire. Only a few days ago, Barrington reported a case of COVID-19 in their schools. Recent numbers in Massachusetts reveal, reveal upwards of 300 new COVID-19 cases each day on average, and their rate of transmission is now up to 1.06, which indicates that the virus is spreading again. New Hampshire's rate is also increasing, and as of a week ago, Florida had reported that more than 31,000 children ages 17 and under have had the coronavirus and 303 of them have been hospitalized. In that state, over the past few weeks, pediatric hospitalizations are up 23% and over 8,000 children have recently tested positive. The percentage of children infected in Florida is still over 10% and five children have died. In addition to getting the virus, children can spread the virus as recent studies indicate that children as young as 10 can infect others in the same capacity that adults can. With all this in mind, the recent increase in COVID-19 cases means that Rockingham County needs to think differently about health and safety. And we are. We're meeting safely today on Zoom rather than meeting in person. It's a state of emergency after all. It's our job together to protect the lives and well-being of Northampton students, employees, and this, and this community. Those employees, again, the teachers, the nurses, the paraprofessionals, counselors, janitors, Everyone, they need your consideration and they need your support in a politicized atmosphere where despite the debate, 160,000 Americans in this country have died. Everyone involved in education needs a safe environment in schools, if that's possible, and support for learning outside of schools when it isn't. As you've agreed, the availability and consistent use of masks and PPE are central in this endeavor. It must also be said that SEU 21 employees' concerns aren't usually matters of choice in this situation. Many have serious health issues that require changes to their working environment so they can be successful. Or they have children who attend other schools with different schedules. Or they have family members with serious health conditions. There are a variety of reasons why they may not be returning to their classrooms, but they all want to continue their practice and achieve the success that they have accomplished in the past. Remember, SAU 21 schools boast some of the best numbers in the state and are consistently ranked in the top 10 list in New Hampshire. However, according to our most recent survey, 83% of 268 Seacoast Education Association teachers and staff, the majority of whom do not have a medical condition, have stated that they're very concerned about their health and their family's health, but they are all trying to make adjustments so they can teach and we can all be successful. These concerns about health are the same reasons that up to 33% of SEU 21 parents are keeping their children home in the fall too. When you folks make a decision as a board, let the health and safety of our students and staff continue to be your top priority in both word and deed. We teachers and staff are looking forward to working with the students of SAU 21 again and sharing in those great times we miss so much and in the safest environment possible in the midst of a pandemic. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Uh, any additional, Rhonda? I think you're on mute. I don't see anybody else with their hands raised right now. Okay. Oh, I have another one. Um, this looks like Steve and Jocelyn Jacks. 
I don't know which one it is or if it's both of them. Hi, it is, uh, it's both of us, but I'll be speaking. I, I'm just, I want to express my concern with the uh, proposed school plan. I know I'm not alone because I've talked to a lot of people in this, in this past 24 hours. But this, pan, this plan of virtual learning for the middle school, it shouldn't be passed. Uh, not only this plan of virtual learning, it wasn't discussed and it wasn't even an option for us. Uh, it seems like the results of the study weren't even considered as this decision. Um, you said it was 66% in favor of going back to school, but I'm pretty sure it was close to 75% when I looked at it. Uh, I have a sixth grader, I'm gonna have a sixth grader, a third grader, and a first grader. So two of my kids are gonna go to school. One's gonna stay home alone while both myself and my wife work. That's not gonna work out financially um, for, I'm sure for several parents out there. This, is, this plan is out of scope. You need to rethink this of the, of the, the common folk of, of Northampton, Hampton, Hampton Falls, Southampton. This is, uh, you really, really need to rethink this. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. We do have somebody else. Um, Claudia White. Yes, um, I agree with Steve also. Um, I'm feeling really disappointed that my kids are not going to have the opportunity to go to school. Um, I feel just really blindsided. Um, we, we were given the opportunity for a survey to say, you know, um, what do you want to do? Do you want your kids to go to school? Do you want them to stay home? Um, you know, do you want online learning? Do you want hybrid? Um, and I just feel that this was not an option and um, everything's just happening so fast and I don't like it. I don't, I'm just feeling really blindsided and it's really upsetting that this was not even an option for parents and for kids. Kids are gonna, uh, parents are gonna drop their kids off at school with one child in the car and another child out, I just, it just, this just doesn't feel right to me. And I don't know how this was, you know, how this came up without any parents even being involved. I just, um, I'm not one to speak up. I tend to be better at writing and um, explaining myself in a different manner. Um, and I just, I feel like I speak for, for others as well. And, um, I'm just really disappointed. What's up, Claudia? We do have, we do have another person, um, Elizabeth Needham. Thank you, Claudia. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Elizabeth Needham. I live at 15 Hampshire Drive. Um, I have two um, students, fifth grade and seventh grade. Um, I'm a teacher as well, not in this district, but um, I can see both the teacher and the parent side of this. And the thought of going back 100% isn't really thrilling to me as a teacher, so I understand the teacher side of it, but remote 100% I don't see as beneficial at all for my own children. Um, if there was just some middle ground where all of the students get to be in school, even if it's not every single day or every single week for that face-to-face -face contact with their teachers, um, which is so important, um, so that when they get home to do their remote learning, they still have that connection and they know, oh, well, in two days, I'm gonna get to go back and I'm gonna get to see my teacher again, or I'm gonna get to go um, ask the questions I need to, I just think all or nothing aren't good options. It's got to be somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I see um, we now have Tamara Sullivan. 
Hi guys, this is Tamara and Jake Sullivan. Uh, we're at 84 North Road and we have a, um, an eighth grader coming up and then a Winnicunit freshman coming up. And Jake and I were just talking and we're just wondering, has an actual decision been made? Uh, like I know we're assuming what we think is happening, but like is, is are things set or or I guess we're just curious, like, are, are we getting upset about things that we don't even know are concrete yet? Um, Tamara, just to interject real quick, there was a joint school board meeting last night with a proposal for all the districts on what yeah. their back to school might look like. That was, uh, what was, what, that was what was on the table last night, and it was voted at the joint school board to bring that to the district level because uh, the bo joint board was uncomfortable voting on districts that weren't, that they weren't responsible for. Right. So we're still not at a, or we're, we're still not at a decision though, right? Like we're, we're still answer, talking about. To answer your question, the decision has not been made. There's a proposal and that's what we will be discussing tonight. Okay. Thank you. I just was a little confused. If I could jump in here, this is Jake talking now. Uh, you can tell the voice is slightly deeper than my <laughs> wife's. Um, I would never ask an educator to go into a situation that was dangerous in any situation. Like, obviously, th there's no control there. We can't, we can't say, yes, it's safe. That being said, shouldn't we be focusing more on making the online side of this thing more robust so that there's more content that can be delivered better uh, outside classrooms so kids can actually get FaceTime or something like that if they do need one-on-one -on -one with teachers. Like, as much as I, I want to talk about how, you know, like, we all want our kids in school, yes, but there's no way we can guarantee everyone's safety. Can't we focus on something that we can control and, and look at what we can do right now? Thanks, guys. Thank you. I have Amy Hyatt. Hi everyone, um, this is Amy Hyatt. I live at 22 Shiprock Road. Um, I sent an email earlier today to the school board and Dr. Lucchini and um, Mrs. Snyder. And so you all sort of saw my thoughts already, but I just wanted to um, just suggest that the board and the administration use some creativity in thinking about the fall. Um, I, I, I feel like we, we've been given some all or nothing choices. First it was, you know, do you want your kids to be in school full time or do you want them to be home full time? And then all of a sudden we heard that several grades will be most likely remote full time. And I just feel like there is some in between that would be thoughtful and logical. For example, using the outdoors in September and October, having classrooms, having classes meet outside where it is very safe um, having kids meet in small groups in the building, having a hybrid situation. I feel like we have, we can use creativity um, to make the situation we have a little bit better. Um, I also want to really, really recommend that we improve the online learning if, if we're in an online learning situation for the middle school um, for the fall. And, and I would really strongly suggest that we use synchronous learning. I thought it was really interesting that there was a distinction noted that when a Cunit was going to be using synchronous learning and that our middle schoolers were not. Um, I see Dr. Lupini shaking his head. So maybe that means that it was misstated in that, in that slide. Um, it, it looked like there was something in the newspaper or somewhere where it said that there was synchronous learning for when a Cunit um, and it, that it wasn't going to be that way for Northampton. So I, I guess I just, I, I understand the situation and I hope that we can um, harness weather and outdoors and improve the online learning so that our kids can can meet with teachers in person um, as, as much as possible. Thank you. Hey, Do you want to take a moment to uh, just clarify that misunderstanding? Sure. Um, and again, I get I, what I would do is recommend that people watch the video of the presentation last night and look at the plan because um, as an example, I believe that every nearly every element that that Amy just talked about is actually in the plan and was addressed in the presentation. We did talk about using outdoor spaces. We did talk about five day a week synchronous learning at all places where um, 
where remote learning in any way is put into place. We gave examples of schedules of how that would occur. And we talked about this as an enhanced model, meaning that there would be opportunities for small groups of kids to actually come into the building to meet with teachers, not only at the high school level, but at the middle level. Um, and quite frankly, in some places where we may end up with, with um, this kind of approach at the elementary level. So uh, Amy, when I read your email this morning, um, my first thought was those, those things were actually all included um, in, in our plan. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Rhonda, any additional comments? Um, there was another hand raised, but I don't, well, I see it now. Hang on. The name is Sean. Sean, can you at least provide a last name? Sean, we have you in here, but you're muted and you need to provide a last name for us and your address. Sean, are you there? Sean, it looks like your mute is off, but we still can't hear you. Okay. Miss him. Should I just bump him back out as an attendee or? Sean, we can't hear. I don't know if you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Yeah. Is there a way to open up a written dialogue for Sean to input his communication to us? We would have to open up the Q&A. Sean's a panelist now, so we should be able to chat. Sean, can you type something into the chat feature? I don't see anything in. I don't. So Sean, maybe you can hear us and we can't hear you. We're going to bump you out and, uh, give, and give a few minutes. Uh, perhaps there's somebody else that we'll go, we'll go for and uh, maybe uh, you could either log back in or try a little reboot on your side. Uh, but we'll give, you, we'll give you a few minutes um, to do that. And uh, hopefully we have another question or I a do. comment. I have somebody named Sandy. Um, and again, Sandy, if you could provide a last name for us and your address, because we only see the first name. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm Sandra Queenan at 222 Atlantic Avenue. And I just wanted to first thank all of you because this is not an easy thing. So um, I know tensions are high, emotions are hot, but that just is an indication of how much we love our kids. So um, thank you guys all for everything that you're doing. I know you're on the hot seat here. Um, you mentioned that I, I didn't go to it last night. Um, I wasn't able to, to watch it. Is there a link or, uh, Bill, you mentioned there's a way that we can watch the record, excuse me, the recording of it. Um, that would be really helpful, I think, for a lot of us. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, um, the video is posted on our SAU 21 website. It's right at the top of the page. Um, and the, uh, if you just want to go through the presentation, the presentation is there as well. But the, but the video actually includes our narration of, of that presentation. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and then again, I'm not going to take one side or the other as far as whether we should be inside or out, you know, at home. Uh, we all have our own opinions on that. But I do feel real strongly that we need to button this up and make sure that the virtual and online component of this is tight um, as quickly as possible because our teachers need time to prepare one way or the other. Um, I am concerned that a lot of the, you know, the things they're saying, like if you have a fever, all that kind of stuff, you know, you have to quarantine, you have to stay home. Well, we're, we're going to hit flu season, right? And those are all the same sort of indications. So if we have kids in school and next thing we know, we have to keep them out for five days and then coming back, you know, I don't want their education disrupted um, because it was disruptive last um, spring. So, you know, as much as we can align the in, in school and out of school, whatever we do, um, I think that's super important that we just, we need to make sure this virtual learning side is a lot better than it was in the spring. 
and that's not that's not a slight against teachers because it was mayhem. I'm just saying we've had all summer now. We, we don't have any excuses. Thank you, Sandy. It looks like we do have Sean back. Um, let's try this again. Um, maybe. Sean, are you there? I'm, I don't know if maybe he just has a bad connection. I, I don't know. Uh, did you promote, uh, did you put him in panelists? I don't even see him on the panel. No, we, I had made him allowed to talk. And when you do that, that brings them over and then he disappeared. So that's why, um, that's how I've been doing everybody. I've been giving them permission to talk and that's when they show up on the screen. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, do we have any additional? I don't see any. Last chance, going once. Oh, oh, we've got a couple. Um, I have Ashley Haas. Okay. Hi, Ashley. Hey, I'm on my wife's uh, Zoom account. This is David Haas. Hi, <laughs> hey, Greg. At uh, 22 Woodnold Drive, um, just wanted to say a few comments. Uh, first of all, it's been apparent to me that the district and the superintendent have done, uh, it's their goal to, to get all the kids back in school. And uh, I'm 100% confident that if that was even a remote possibility, it would happen. Um, so. The plan laid forth um, has my has my support, um, and I, I, I urge everybody to not think of their independent situations, but the community as a whole. And um, yeah, so I support the plan. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Have Wendy Wallace. Hello. Hi, Wendy. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Hi, sorry, I'm terrible at this. Um, I wasn't planning to speak. Um, what, I just, I don't know. If, excuse me, I'm sorry. If you don't mind uh, stating your address and you. Oh, and, so sorry. Um, Wendy, yep, it's 74 Exeter Road. Thank you. And I have, I should also mention, I work at the school as an educational associate. Um, and I don't know if this is going to come across as more of a question than a comment, but I just, in hearing when we keep talking about, um, the enriched, you know, virtual, we keep saying middle school, middle school. And I'm just wondering when fifth grade became middle school. Um, because I understand a little bit more when we're talking about sixth, seventh and eighth graders and their ability to be a bit more independent. And I'm just not sure from people I've talked to today, how we feel about that possibility with fifth graders. Um, and this particular fifth grade class is only about 30 kids, I believe. And I was just, unclear as to why they weren't included in more of the elementary plan and have now been put with the middle school plan. Again, that's probably more of a question than a comment, and I apologize. No, thank you. Uh, we'll be getting to a lot of these questions in our regular discussion um, after this. So thank you for the comment. I don't see any more right now. Okay, with that, I think I'm going to move on. We've We've, um, hopefully everybody got to, to speak up. Um, our email addresses are public as well. If you, if you have any additional comments, uh, please feel free. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is, sorry, I'm trying to move my screens here. Uh, school council uh, update. Uh, Susan? Hi, so um, we shared information about the progress report from last year's school improvement plan uh, back in June and we submitted the new school improvement plan to the board. Um, and, I, and I believe we'll be rescheduling a board retreat to, to, to go over that in a little bit more detail. Um, but essentially the, the update I would have for, for leadership council is that our, our plan and our hope is to um, 
have some direction and approval of a structure for return to school so that then we can pull together the leadership council as um, a guiding board to help us make some of the nuts and bolts recommendations that I think will be forthcoming and to help get some of the the actual planning that people are speaking of now um, that needs to happen between now and when when um, instruction actually begins. So um, we do plan to loop our leadership council into some of those discussions. We have a tentative meeting scheduled for um, next Friday, August 14th. Susan. Any additional uh, questions for Susan? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, moving on. Plan for con uh, continuing business. Item six plan for return to school. Dr. Bikini. So, um, what I, I guess what I'll say to start us off is, is, is this. We had a pretty robust conversation at our earlier meeting tonight about something that didn't get mentioned in the questions, and that is that at whatever grade levels are back in school, we continue to offer, and the, and the Joint Board did authorize last night, um, the recreation of a remote learning academy. We know that whether it's at Southampton or Northampton or our other schools where we're bringing students back in, in K through eight, whatever grades uh, happen to be coming back. We know there are parents who've expressed an interest in uh, having a remote experience for, for lots and lots of different reasons. And so that is gonna be available and we're hoping to get something out about that option even next week. Um, I guess a second comment I would want to make is, is really something I said a few minutes ago, and that is that I think, it's, I think it's worth your time to look at the materials from last night and the presentation from last night. Um, I, I want to say that um, Dr. Hobbs and, and, and Becca Carlson, who's here from, from your school, were really part of that team on teaching and learning and spent an awful lot of time on proposing those modifications, those enhancements, um, to, to the remote plan. Um, and as I said earlier, they, they now include opportunities for small groups of kids to come into the building. They include a schedule. Um, we have samples in there. They won't end up being the final of that schedule, but they include um, schedules that guarantee um, live experiences with uh, educators um, each day. Um, and as I said, they include opportunities to come into the building in small groups to meet with teachers. There are, there are lots of enhancements um, to that experience that we think are the lessons learned. Um, and Jason Saltmarsh, our director of technology at the high school, who's also a Northampton resident, was a big part of, of that experience as well. Um, there are a lot of fact, as I said last night, um, there are a lot of factors that led us to this particular recommendation and our recommendations are differentiated um, by our schools. Uh, we think that's a strength in that we, we believe we took a look at the data at each school and data did consist of looking at those surveys, but it didn't consist of looking at those surveys alone. It consisted of looking at our, our staffing in terms of, and there's a, I think a pretty robust discussion in the presentation of our, our staff and, and the issues that they face um, with because I think if we've discovered anything over the last number of months, it's how interdependent our school districts in the southeast part of the state are. Um, they're not independent, and yet um, people are adopting different models that are causing issues for parents, for employees at, at a variety of, of districts in, in all districts. And so we've tried to look, take a look at all of those through the lens of something that I think Mr. Duffy said to me early on in this, trying to get all of our students back into school every day, five days a week for a complete day. That's our goal, right? And, and one thing I don't think we, we did well enough last night was really explain that these, whatever these, pre, these, these uh, present status are when they're adopted, whatever's adopted, and we would also like something adopted very soon so, because we have less than five weeks now to put whatever in place. Um, but that's a starting point. And, and we've, we've been trying to develop a set of metrics and a timeline for working against that toward the idea of getting more people back into school. So for example, for people who start out in a remote, 
and have that opportunity to um, come in in small groups to meet with teachers. Our goal is to increase those numbers throughout the weeks and to take a look every other week at how we can increase those numbers of students that are actually in school with the ultimate aim of trying to make sure that, that all of our students um, can return um, when it's safe. So I really do think that presentation um, and the slides from last night are worth your while and I, I hope you all have an opportunity to see them if you weren't able to join us for the meeting last night. Um, I know that your building level people have been working on some particulars of, of implementation and I know that Susan and Becca want to talk about some of those things, is that right? And Tracy maybe as well, but um, so I'll, can I, is that okay, Greg, if I turn it to Susan now? Yes, and, and so I think I would just, I would just make the comment that um, there, there were a lot of public comments and, and I think at this point we're having a discussion between the, the board and the administration and the SAU 21. And so I, I would, I, I uh, appreciate the expanded um, explanation. Uh, we got a, a lot of work and probably a lot of questions that the board has. Um, so I would just uh, encourage us to keep it focused within this group. I know we have an audience, but uh, this is a working session. Um, we got a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thanks. So can I share my screen again? We have um, some slides that uh, we'd like to share with you. So um, I'm going to kick it off and then pass it over to Becca and to Tracy. And um, right about now, I wish I was Marcia Zavez, just saying. <laughs> So Susan, can I can I ask you a question real quick? This additional information is additional to what was uh, presented last night, and and uh, shed some clarity around some of these models. Is that so what we're talking? About? I think what what it really is is it's Northampton specific factors and and kind of um, some the reasoning behind why this proposal was recommended for Northampton School. Okay, so sounds good. It's not too long. We'll we'll be. We'll leave no, no. time for talking. We're, we're here all night. <laughs> <laughs> I cleared my schedule. We're here all night. <laughs> Please take your all your kidding aside. Take, take your time and let's um let's be a thorough thorough process. Okay. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity for to for us to explain some of our thinking behind um, the plan for Northampton School. We we really appreciate um, the time and the attention to our school specifically. When we when we started thinking about exactly how to present this, we wanted to come back to the guiding values that were that were used in planning and that the return to school task force used and many of us were part of that return to school task force. So those four areas were safety, equity, wellness and teaching and learning. And so we looked at some of the Northampton specific um, opportunities and challenges through the lens of those four guiding um, values. And then we also wanted to make sure to just mention our school values and our new acronym PRIDE and just bring it back to the fact that this is a scenario with a pandemic that's unprecedented and it's required perseverance on the part of our students, on the part of our faculty, on the part of our administration and the school board. Um, we view our responsibility to provide safe and um, equitable education for our students. We take it very seriously. Um, we, we want to um, pay close attention to the integrity of the models that we're proposing. It's our sincere desire to do the right thing for Northampton School and we have nothing but empathy for our students, our families, our staff, our teachers, and the board members who, you know, you guys are teachers of your students at home this spring, your parents, and, and now you're charged with making decisions um, for the greater good of the whole district. So we appreciate um, the position that everyone is in and um, please believe that we take none of this lightly. We've, we've really thought things through as much as we possibly could. Um, we wanted to highlight the, the fact that the proposal is for the start of the school year and it's our sincere hope that we're able to shift into some other models. But in, in making the proposal, we wanted to have the ability to be flexible so that we could transition between in-person, remote, or a hybrid model, depending on the circumstances. We may start in-person with some kids need to shift if, if um, health conditions get worse. So 
and we might be able to shift the other way if things get better. So we, we want to make sure that we have the ability to be flexible. Um, we understand that we need to further define the criteria for adjusting the model and we'll take that advice from the SAU and from the medical um, professionals who are consulting with SAU 21. Um, in making these recommendations, we took into consideration the kind of, in, the kind of um, intersection of class size, numbers of students in each grade level, space within our school, and the ability to staff appropriately. And again, as I said, we paid attention to the guiding values of safety, equity, wellness, and teaching and learning with the ultimate goal for all students to return to school in person. So the structure, as you know, and for, for folks who um, maybe didn't get to attend last night's joint board meeting, the, the, the structure that was proposed at the joint board meeting for Northampton School was, and I just wrote trimester one here, but uh, honestly, that would be, um, dependent. It doesn't necessarily have to mean the entire trimester. It's just as this is how we would start and then it depends on on other criteria that we identify. But the proposal was pre-K to grade four in-person instruction with restrictions, which would be the kinds of safety features that we'll need to put into place for any in-person um, instruction at school, or parents could choose the SAU 21 Remote Learning Academy, which to be clear, could include um, students or would it probably include students and teachers from other schools within SAU 21. And then the option for grades five to eight it would be the enriched virtual learning. And Becca will talk in um, greater detail about what that would look like and how that's hopefully different from um, the crisis learning that, that we provided last spring. And then hopefully trimester two and three, we're really hopeful for a return to brighter days. So the first question is, is why did we recommend pre-K to grade four in person? Um, as opposed to something different. And um, in the case of Northampton School, um, we, I, again, we, we took the look um, from the lenses of safety, equity, wellness, and teaching and learning. And in terms of safety, the class sizes in our younger grades allowed for um, a safer return. We have smaller class sizes in our primary grades. The space that we have available is adequate. Um, we could deliver meals to classrooms. We feel that we have the ability to design safe arrival and dismissal procedures with fewer students in the building. We really felt that if we had all of our students in the building, that arrival and dismissal would be um, not safe, honestly. Just, you know, it would be really impossible to, to kind of control the entry and the, the mixing if, if we're using a cohort model, which is our plan to use a cohort model where we have students in their self-contained classrooms so that we can control how many people they're exposed to. And then if there was a need for contact tracing, it would be doable. Um, in terms of equity, one of the things I think I'd like to just point out and, and folks may see it differently, but from an educational lens, equity doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. It means that everyone gets what they need. And um, in our estimation, we felt that our youngest students needed the ability to develop the foundational academic and social skills in person um, that they, if we decided to shorten the day a little bit, we could have them access um, unified arts content virtually, but special education services would be available within the cohort model and in person. And we would begin with technology access, um, even in the younger grades so that our students could become familiar with the devices and the platforms should there be a need to shift to remote learning in these younger grades later on in the fall. Um, our commitment to wellness involves the fact that our youngest students really require movement and can access the outdoor space. We have um, arranged to rent three large tents with sides on them. Um, they don't have floors, but they have side curtains to enable us to get outside a little bit more, even if the weather gets a little bit challenging. Um, there will be procedures in place for six students and attention to social emotional learning again in a revised format because this is going to feel different because of some of the safety restrictions the you know the need to have um, student seating six feet apart the need to move in the hallways um, very you know, carefully with students six feet apart and um, and the need to spend more time within that self-contained environment um, in terms of teaching and learning again that we found 
or we believe that the foundational skill instruction is best delivered in person for our youngest students, that this would enable us to um, administer individual reading and math assessments so that we can address gaps in early reading and um, foundational math skills. And, and we do believe that uh, although this is a little bit yet to be determined, we believe we have the appropriate staffing levels to, to um, make this happen. In terms of concerns that we have, um, we will need to serve lunch in classrooms in order to keep a safe environment. We'll need to develop a schedule for the outdoor space. Um, we can't have everyone out there at once, even though it sounds like a great idea to um, use the outdoors. We still need to um, kind of control that so that there aren't large groups of kids in an outdoor space. That would be the, the place where kids could take masks off and, and hopefully we could use um, outdoor spaces for instruction and learning when the weather's good and, and we bought the tent, we're not, we didn't buy the tents, we rented the tents for two months for September and October. Um, we'll need to develop those arrival and dismissal procedures and make sure that they're safe. We're going to need to utilize the additional spaces that become um, available within the school due to um, not having all the students there at the same time. We would likely pair a UA teacher with a cohort or a grade to ensure that cohort integrity. So what that means is um, we would perhaps have the music teacher with third grade. And, um, and if, if, we use, if, we, if we go with a regular school day, um, regular hours, then the music teacher would provide the UA class for third grade and they wouldn't have art or, or phys ed for a period of time because we wanna keep the cohort and um, the integrity of the cohort. Um, UA instruction and schedule will be impacted again, um, and, and we are considering a shortened day having, having the UAs virtually um, delivered so that kids could get access to all of the UAs. We will follow all the health and safety protocols, and including sending six students and teachers home, and that, you know, a challenge there could be if we have a lot of teachers sick, um, what, what will we do? Um, and, and one of the big things is we all have a goal of getting our kids back in the building and seeing them face to face, but there's no question this is going to feel different. Um, the, the, um, the safety and health protocols are going to feel different. There will be you know, dividers in some cases, plexiglass dividers for small group instruction. Kids will wear masks, teachers will wear masks. Um, all of these things are going to make it feel different and that's a reality. Um, and then the other, just, the other concern is that the staffing isn't finalized. We actually don't have um, all of the information that we need just yet. Um, so those are some of the concerns we have. And then Becca will pick it up from here and talk about um, why we're recommending that grades five through eight um, be administered in an enriched virtual learning environment. Becca, take it away. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? I apologize to interrupt, Becca. Sure. You, you, you mentioned something I think is pretty important. You mentioned that um, staffing isn't finalized because we don't have all the information you need yet. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I can. Yeah, Bill can take that. Yeah, can. <laughs> um, so uh, for the most part, that, that that's about the conversation that we had last evening about the, um, the, the rights that employees have under the Americans with Disabilities Act in terms of family medical leave, in terms of the COVID bill from the spring and particularly um, child care issues as it relates to that bill um, having to do with um, their school age students, uh, for example, in school um, those kinds of things. Um, those information um, we, uh, we're still gathering um, and, and uh, out of HR. Um, those are very confidential uh, pieces of information and discussions. Um, you know, people, people have a right to have those conversations with HR and, and, and produce documentation and those kinds of things. And, and we're trying to move those uh, along as, as we can knowing that there are no timelines that we can actually set for those conversations. People have a right to initiate those conversations whenever, and some of them live in school districts that haven't yet decided on models. So they have their, they're waiting for information and we're waiting for them. Um, so all of, those, all of those kinds of things uh, are, are what, the, what you're building people are, are referring to uh, when they say they don't have all that information yet. Perfect. Thank, so thank you, Dr. Lapini. Um, I, I want to hear from uh, Becca, 
but I do want to say that I think it's going to be important for us to um, come back to this part of the conversation later on because there are a lot of important factors and, and it's not about any individual employee, um, but we need to talk about what the rights are and what the law is and the impact that that has on the school overall as we, as we look forward. So I want to come back to this in a little bit. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Um, so I'd like to speak to our recommendation that we'll, we would begin our school year with fifth through eighth grade in an enriched remote learning model. This decision was obviously not arrived at easily and I'll be using the four lenses as Ms. Snyder did of the return to school guiding values to explain our reasoning for this. First, thinking about safety. We want to reduce the risks to our students, families, and employees while ensuring that our students have access to quality learning experiences. Thinking about class size, for example, as our students mature and can work more independently, the recommended class sizes increase and the number of adults that are supporting students within the classroom generally decreases. So as a result of this and our enrollment numbers, our class sizes in fifth grade through eighth grade are above the recommended cohort number and we we don't have the necessary staffing or classroom space to divide these into smaller cohorts. Working off of that, talking about the space concerns, the middle school model does not allow for self-contained classrooms and neither teachers nor students should be transitioning um, throughout the day through multiple classrooms. Uh, the middle school hallway is also another space concern that we have because it dead ends the way that it does, it cannot be used as, um, it can only, it cannot be used as a one-way hallway and becomes a pretty significant bottleneck um, of student traffic. And then finally, thinking about um, the middle school teachers um, interacting with between 30 and 71 students on a regular basis and comparing that with between 11 and 17 in, in our other grades. Second, thinking about equity, um, we want to provide age appropriate instruction and fa uh, fair access to technology meals and other supports. We are ready to leverage technology for student learning in grades five to eight. We are able to provide MacBooks for our sixth to eighth graders and we have new iPads with keyboards for all of our students in grade five. Um, in regards to student support, special ed services would be available both online and in person. Um, additionally, online learning lends itself well to accommodations and modifications for students, and um, Ms. Griffin-Hagen will be speaking more to that after I'm done. And while students are in the enriched virtual learning, we want to make sure that everyone understands that the meal distributions would continue. Third, thinking about the wellness lens, we're committed to creating an environment that is supportive of student and staff mental health and wellness. Um, this summer, um, Northampton school teachers have been attending a lot of social emotional professional development courses. Most of our elementary teachers who had not previously attended Open Circle are beginning their year long training um, this month actually. And the middle school team and the administration attended a four day intensive uh, responsive classroom training. All of these trainings, as well as the many other learning experiences that our teachers have participated in this summer, were done online. So our teachers have had the experience of being students learning online. They've also had the opportunity to discuss with experts how to implement the social emotional learning best practices in an online environment. They're prepared to hold meaningful advisory and community meetings online and to integrate social emotional learning into their academic lessons. And we understand that many of our families would like our students to return to normal this September, but as Ms. Snyder said, our classrooms can't yet be normal. Um, in person would not be like it was. And we believe that we can provide meaningful opportunities for students to build community in small groups and to know and be known by their teachers and peers this fall. Finally, the teaching and learning component. We're committed to ensuring that every student is on track for success academically, socially, and emotionally. As I've mentioned, we have been and will continue to engage in professional development to provide teachers the tools they need to achieve this goal. The third trimester of 2019-20 was crisis remote teaching. I'm really proud of what we accomplished, but that's not the standard for 2020-2021. We have a new enriched virtual learning model at Northampton School. This model allows each student to be taught by a highly qualified teacher certified in the appropriate grade span and content with training and online instruction. Teaching would be both synchronous and asynchronous. Teachers would be providing direct instruction, personalized feedback, and create collaborative learning opportunities for their students. 
Students will be supported by the staff and faculty. They be coached and scaffolded as they develop important skills critical to online learning, um, such as communication, responsibility, time management. And teachers and students will be accountable for the learning objectives in the curriculum. Relevant and engaging assessments will provide evidence of student learning and we will be reporting to parents. Next slide, please, Ms. Snyder. So our concerns about um, the enriched remote learning model, um, we realized that in the spring, we had ebbs and flows for student engagement. So we're gonna need to use multiple strategies like um, student voice and choice, small group collaboration to promote student participation and engagement. We'll need to provide meaningful assessments of student learning. Um, these assessments need to be engaging and relevant for our students. We're gonna need to begin the school year with a focus on developing classroom communities and meeting students' social and emotional needs. Um, as we know from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, students need to feel safe and have a sense of belonging before they can learn. We'll need to examine scope and sequence of curricula. That's something that we're actually gonna be doing across the board in, in all of our grades. Um, we'll need to create a system for materials to be distributed and collected on a regular basis. This um, will both help promote students uh, connection with our schools and will allow for non digital learning experiences, things like labs and projects work like that. Um, we'll need to create opportunities for small groups of students to safely meet face to face. And honestly, we don't know yet what this is going to look like, but that is a priority for us to have those students in small groups in our in our buildings. And we'll need to ha have benchmarks for transitioning to the phases of increased face-to-face -face instruction. When can we have larger groups of students together in the building? When can students uh, meet for longer periods of time? These are all questions that need to, be, need to be addressed. So while we certainly have unanswered questions, we also have a priority list based on the lessons from the spring and the work that we've been doing this summer. And now I'll hand it over to Ms. Griffin Hagen to talk about special education. And this is a hard act to follow. You know, I was hoping, Greg, that my last board meeting would just be like a show and tell without, you know, drama and presentations, but you had to pull this off. So thanks. Thanks for that. Um, you know, Tracy, <laughs> so for special education, you know, it falls in line with exactly what Susan and Becca have been saying, you know, for safety. Uh, it, just as Dr. R. Kellyan said yesterday for the joint board, we're going to hope that um, special education meetings occur virtually to the maximum extent possible, but with flexibility to meet family need. Evaluations will continue with appropriate plexiglass dividers and PPEs. Um, any in-building supports will not be pushed into the classroom again to maintain that cohort environment and to limit the number of of a, of adults that children are seeing and the number of children that adults are seeing. And, and Susan, Becca and I are working closely in terms of the organization of that. Um, the, the educational associates will stay with their assigned classes and supporting those special ed teachers. There are occasions where we split an EA's day between grades and we will, we will limit that, that um, or, or not have that. So that again, it's that cohort based model um, and we're looking at the organization of special ed case managers, especially for pre-K through four, so that they are working with a cohort. We had a really robust conversation during the director's meeting today. We shared a lot of great ideas um, that, that I think will serve us well. In terms of equity, you know, we're going to provide services. We're going to make sure that services are delivered and they are delivered well. That's what your special ed staff does at Northampton School, regardless of the situation. That's what they did from March until June. That's what they have done with extended school year services. And that's what they will continue to do with the fall, unequivocally. Um, we will continue to look at creative use of staff and contracted providers. Um, and we will continue to offer services as prescribed through IEPs. It will look different student to student, and that's why it's called an individualized education plan, so that we can individualize how that happens. As far as wellness goes, as Becca and Susan have emphasized, this SEL, the social emotional well being for all students, is of utmost importance, whether they are identified or not. For students who get counseling and behavioral support services, we will offer in-person and virtual, just like we will do for speech and language, OT, PT, or specialized instruction. That doesn't go away in this environment, and um, the SAU has been 
You, you muted yourself somehow. My mother may have done that all the way from Ann Arbor, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, as far as teaching and learning goes, this, this just emphasizes it again, what Susan and Becca have said. We have a highly qualified special education staff, related service providers contractor providers and EAs. We are well resourced. We have um, learned to network. I have, um, and we have developed relationships with contractor providers who like to work with Northampton. So we have so many options available for us to deliver services to families. I feel comfortable in saying that we will be able to do that. And Becca, Susan and I are in constant communication about that as um, Dr. Ara Kellyan and I are as well. So that that continues regardless if I'm here, if I'm in Ann Arbor, if I decide to go to Bangladesh to rescue puppies. Um, progress monitoring, parent communication, IEP and service delivery, um, that will continue to be monitored and will occur. And, and we will continue to use technology as a specialist at step as we've been doing. I mean, we've done that whether we were in brick and mortar 100% or not. Your special ed staff, is always looking at technology and ways to use it to help modify and accommodate and support students. So that will continue. As far as concerns, this was difficult for me because special ed parents have a lot of concerns as does the special ed director. We wanna make sure we're doing this well. So special ed staff will work with students remotely and in person. And I had a hard time putting this as a concern because they can do this. This is what they've done. They can do this well. We will have continued vig vigilance with progress monitoring um, to ensure that whatever service delivery model a student is getting is working. As Becca and Susan have said, we will need a system um, to distribute materials. We'll need to create opportunities for small groups of students to safely meet face to face. And we will need to make sure that there is ample time for general ed and special ed staff to collaborate, which would have occurred in a brick and mortar building. It's just sort of emphasizing the obvious. Um, so, you know, again, I feel like you have a strong team here. Special ed is a concern to, the, to parents. I am not minimizing that. We are already scheduling meetings to discuss what plans look like, what we need to do to make sure that a student um, has received what they need and if, if if we need to add extra services we will we, we already have a lot of those meetings scheduled and um, and a concern that I didn't add but I'm sure it's on the minds is how will we make sure that this transition occurs between Tracy and a new director and I can tell you that this is a constant conversation you have an incredibly ample administrative staff to include Susan and Becca and Dr. R. Kellyan and we will make sure that happens I am not just abandoning Northampton. I am committed to making sure that whatever transition process needs to happen will happen so that our students and our families um, are, are serviced. That's what will occur, not might occur. That's what will occur because you have a committed staff. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. So the last, this is this is optional for the board, um, but we thought we'd model some of the things that that we learned in our summer trainings with responsive classroom, and one of them was to send folks off into small groups, which we can't really do here. But we wondered if you wanted to start off giving us feedback um, in that three, two, one format. Three things you're concerned about, two things you like about the plan, and a question you have. I'm sure you have more than one question. If this um, suggestion doesn't fit with the the plan for the rest of the discussion greg that's fine but we just thought we'd throw that out there as an idea um, i'm going to stop sharing the screen and bring it back uh, i'm open to any format i think you know we can do the three two one we can launch into questions i'm sure we will cover it all and uh that's up to you it was just a thought we had so you you decide well, why don't we open it up uh, right now for questions from the board, and if it's and, and if we need to, we can move to that to that model. But right now, I think uh, there's a lot on people's mind, um, and so I'd like to open up to the board for for comments and questions. Thank you guys for taking us a level deeper, so that we have a better understanding of um, of kind of why the decisions were made and what what went in what facts went into that. Um, and 
So Tracy, appreciate your, your efforts there. And um, you know, you can't run off to Ann Arbor and hide, uh, especially from me. I, I can find you there. <laughs> uh, I don't want to hide. I, I'm here. I'm committed. I, I want to make sure this works. I mean, we've, you know, we've got an incredible community and um, we're, we're going to be okay. <clears throat> appreciate it. Um, board members, any, any questions off the bat? Oh, no, that's okay. Um, going through the whole plan and, and what we are looking at, um, the questions, the concerns, the likes, the dislikes, the people, the how does this affect everyone um, can't be minimized, I guess. Um, enriched virtual learning, going in, how do we sort it all out? My question, my major question here is with what we are looking for, even for the students on our pre-K through fourth in our school, are we keeping them just to the lower level? Or are we spreading them out throughout the school, including the upper levels? Um, and if we are utilizing the teachers willing to go to school, for just those kids that are gonna be there. So then for these other enriched virtual learners, the staff that is unable to go to school, are they gonna be willing at any one point to meet in a small group in a classroom with the kids that are gonna be learning from home? So That's one. I can take the second part of that. Um, and, and, un and unfortunately, the answer would be it depends. So there is, a, as we explained last night, there's a myriad of reasons that would lead someone to make some sort of a request. And so um, the example I've used, which is not a Northampton-centric example, but I think is helpful, is that we know that one of the issues we have are, are teachers of ours who live in the Hampton School District and have young kids in the Hampton School District. And Hampton has chosen a hybrid model that is either Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday. And so the kids are in school two days a week in that model. And that has caused, um, that model has caused a, a, a considerable issue for our employees. Um, and so what we've talked about, because we've talked about people who are teaching in the enhanced uh, virtual space, to be in buildings, what we've talked about is that, that a, 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 a reasonable accommodation for a person in that, in that space that I just laid out would be that they would be in the building during the time that their children are in school, at least. And that they might be teaching remotely, remotely, remotely during those other three days so that at least some number of days a week, they would be available for the in-person meetings with small groups, those, those kinds of things. Someone who's out having to do with more of a medical issue of their own, of someone who lives in the home, I, I don't know. Every one of those is different and we would have to go through with them and that's what Charlene will do as part of this planning and we have a number of those requests throughout the SOU but Charlene would go through each of those and a reasonable accommodation plan would be developed that could allow that person to be in the building sometime with additional PPE or not. So that, that's the best answer I can give you. So to answer your question about the space, um, we have, we've identified spaces where um, classes could spread out a bit. However, I will tell you that first and second grade, our numbers are such that um, they probably will be able to stay in their rooms without, without splitting up too much. But we've identified the two art rooms on the first floor as potential breakout areas for the kindergartens and the outdoor space as well. Um, we've identified the rooms upstairs across from the fourth grades as 
um, the breakout spaces for fourth grade. There's two rooms directly across the hall, one from each of the fourth grades. And then um, special education staff currently share spaces upstairs, and we would need to separate them so that they could provide their own small group instruction. So I think we would, we would be spreading out into the unused spaces that would be vacated. Um, and it, it, some of that is dependent on a number of other factors, but um, that's essentially where we are at the moment. But, but Susan raises one other issue that I want to make sure we get into this conversation here. And that is that in every case, whatever district we're talking to over the, over the next two days, we've made assumptions about numbers of first graders, numbers of second graders, numbers of third graders. And, and there, are, there are some statewide data that tell us that those numbers may end up being high. Right? We know that VLAX is oversubscribed across the state. We know that the parochial schools are reporting waiting lists and they've not been able to fill seats prior for lots and lots and lots of different reasons, those, those two things being two, two very different models. So as we, what we have to get to next week and get to very quickly, whether it's Southampton or an approval of some plan here tonight, is trying to verify numbers. Because it could very well be, as I said to you last night, that, that model that we proposed last night is the model for right now that will change in many, if not all, of our districts. It will change due to the factors, those enrollment numbers, those staff availability numbers, the question that you just asked, Nermina, those kinds of things are going to require adjustments throughout the next five weeks. We know that. Thank you. So can I ask a quick question, maybe Becca, um, in regards to the uh, K through four and then five through eight, it seems like the fifth graders did get lumped in with middle school. W what was the thought process around that uh, not being K through uh, five and then six, seven, eight? Susan, would you like me to, to do this one or would you like to speak to it? I'm happy to. Uh, why don't you take it and if there's anything to add, I can jump in. Yep. So um, two uh, significant factors are around um, class size and space and our ability to, um, to address those with fifth grade successfully. And then we have uh, robust technology to support fifth grade um, fully um, online. So both the challenge of, um, of having fifth grade meet safely and the fact that we felt confident we could support them with robust technology were two of the key factors in, in that plan. Okay. And I'll just add, honestly. Class, classroom size, um, what size is fifth grade this year? Thank you. So I, I can speak to that in just a second. What I was going to say is initially, if I could have made a recommendation, I would have said pre-K to three in person because our fourth and fifth grades are a little bit larger. Than the, than the early primary grades. And so they are um, around between 15 and 17 in, in both of those grades. But the fourth grade, um, we had, the teachers had already had a plan to, to have a co-teaching model in, um, in at least one of the classrooms. And so we had the ability to provide certified staff to, to break the, the fourth grade group up yep. um, a little more, um, Sufficiently, whereas with fifth grade, the only way to break them into smaller groups would have involved using EAs who are really responsible for special education services, and they're you know the kids wouldn't get the level of instruction that that they deserve in terms of um, having their their certified qualified teacher with them all the time. So they would, in order to to meet the cohort size standard for for most of the day, we couldn't. We felt more comfortable putting fifth grade. In with the middle schoolers because they will be able to um, be with their teacher all t all the time and we had additional staffing available for fourth grade based on some planning we had done in the spring what is what's the, the fifth grade, grade number yeah oh, sorry tom same question okay, same question yeah there's 30 kids in the fifth grade class i believe so, so in fifth grade we have we have 15 we have 15 and 16 and and in fourth grade we have 16 and 16 so there and then in in the younger grades third grades are 12 and 13 um second grades 11 and 12 first grades 12 and 13 so like the numbers are just much lower 
in the lower grades. And so that's, that's where we came to, that's why we came to that recommendation. And so again, a Northampton recommendation, is it similar across the SAU that, you know, if it's more than 15 kids in a class, it's too big? Um, or is that a Northampton specific decision? Um, we took a look within parameters across the SAU and also took a look, Tom, at those percentages of people who um, said they were interested in the remote um, Got environment. Got it. So we may need to get to that then um, because I think it's important that we clearly talk about our, our teachers and their safety and their, their rights. Um, so Greg, can I talk for a quick second? Yeah, well, can yeah. I just say to that? Can, to can that I get point? the target? Co what is your target cohort number? Well, the target would be ten, but we feel like we've got like elevens and twelves that are workable. So, okay. so, but I want to go back to what I said before because I think if there's anything I've learned in the last five months, and this, and, and many of you know me a little bit, so this is not this is not me. I've had to get comfortable with being uncomfortable with 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 not knowing things. And that's not, I don't like that. Um, and so this, this, we're gonna find out a lot when we, when we ask. We know that in all of our schools. So for example, you know, on, on, on average across our SAU, 14% of people said remote learning academy. We, we need to see if that, those numbers hold. If those numbers hold in your K through four, we, we could be back making slightly different recommendations of being able to bring in more kids. We could. It depends, but we need to get to getting that information. Got it. So Greg, may I? Yes. So first of all, um, thank you. This presentation was really excellent in terms of uh, the details regarding the specific rec recommendations around um, Northampton. Over the last 48 hours, I've kind of had an aha moment as well because Dr. Lupini, you, you mentioned last night um, and a couple of other times uh, about the, the impact that other SAUs that neighbor us has on our decision making. And I scratched my head a little bit about that um, at first. And then I did some research around the FFCRA and expanded um, family medical leave. And the fact that, um, you know, our, we need to make sure that we're uh, not only honoring and protecting um, all of our employees, right, as any organization does, but following the law. Um, and the fact that if, uh, if somebody has a school that's not going back full time and they have a child in that school, that under the federal law, they have a right to 12 weeks of expanded uh, COVID FMLA at pay, right? If, if teachers aren't able to come in, in that example that you gave uh, with Hampton, um, and we talked last night about substitutes, we don't have teachers to teach our kids. So we're trying to find something here that's that's again, threading the needle, right? So I, I absolutely respect the personal decisions that teachers need to make for their own health, for people that they're taking care of, for their children, and that we need to work within the law to make sure that we're um, taking care of everybody, right? As I'm listening to this though, I also wonder if there are additional strategies that we can consider. So we've got staff, we've got staffing questions, right? Cause we don't know who's gonna who needs it to put in for time or, or who can work remotely. And we need to figure that out and give you time to do that. I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, well, let me actually pause there to make sure there's no corrections about what I said. And then I'll ask a couple of quick questions. I think that's, I'll look at Mr. Ferrara for the details on the, on the, on the wall, but I think that's correct. Yes. Yeah, well said, Tom. Yeah. So I mean, we, we, we've got some legal, legal constraints here that, and plus it just, you know, we have to do it. Now there's also families that are in a pinch. So, um, and while they may have the same rights, right, maybe they've already used it in the spring. Maybe they can't really, they don't feel comfortable doing it. So we've got to figure out how to take care of these students and families. So are there other strategies that we can think about? So for example, um, and I'm just spitballing here. Can, could we open the gym for, and I'm not really looking for answers, I'm just brainstorming, open the gym for middle schoolers who, uh, or fifth graders who are doing the enriched virtual learning, have some proctors there, give them access to what high speed internet, have it be on a sign up basis in case, you know, they, they, they want to see other kids or in case they don't have anybody at home to, to be with them. 
could we do things in middle school like once we find out the staffing, maybe have half the kids in, as Libby Needham talked about, um, so that you know there's some social emotional learning and exchange and connection, um, and maybe even phase that in. Um, can we can we look at um, just a, a, and I'm not trying to overcomplicate things, but can we look at kind of some blended models that help to accommodate all and and fulfill our legal obligation? Well, well, okay. So thank you for that. You're not you're not overcomplicating at all because you may remember from the presentation. I think it was in the presentation last night. We have talked about um, some community partnerships. Um, around programming for students who are on more remote experiences. The two examples that we've used in our conversations have been Northampton Rec and have been SAS at, at, in Seabrook. So, so right, those are, those are ideas that we've, we've kicked around in this idea of how do, we bring in, how do we bring in kids, small groups of kids working up to larger group of kid, groups of kids over, over time. Um, the, you know, the other one I'll offer that you, you, you didn't mention that, and, and, and I think, I don't think you were at the joint board meeting two weeks ago, but I, I mentioned at the joint board meeting that I have colleagues in other SAUs, they tend to be single district SAUs, ours is a little bit more complicated for the idea I'm about to throw out, but they, they are um, extending to their employees the, the um, ability to bring their children to their districts for this year. Why are they doing that? When it's not in their collective bargaining agreement, where they have space in a classroom, they're doing it because that gives that employee the accommodation that they need in order to, to, to be in the building. Yep, right. I love so, that. So it's a, it's, it, those, those districts are looking at it and saying, this is a win-win. So all those examples, I think, should be on the table for us to explore. Yes. So I've heard today from a Northampton school teacher who is supposed to go to school, and yet her kids are not because they are in those upper grades, and she teaches in the lower grades. Mm -hmm. um, how do we kind of sort it all out, and how come we didn't look at a more of a hybrid giving uh, – all kids on a smaller scale a chance two days Wednesday off cleaning um, or whatever and then two days for the other kids well in terms of our employees the hybrid didn't buy us anything because even if we ran the hi same hybrid as Hampton the people in Hampton actually have the same problem so in terms of our staffing it actually didn't achieve any advantage and Dr. Hobbs Becca I know you talked about modeling particularly in the return to instruction um, discussion. So do, do you wanna do you wanna take that question? Yeah, I mean I think one of the, the primary things we discussed and I and it's been discussed in this meeting is in, in that kind of hybrid setting, you're really only having two contact days with a student per week as a teacher. Um, and the rest of the time you're gonna have to do some sort of asynchronous assignment or passive learning. Um, and it struck from a curriculum standpoint, Becca, please step in if if I'm off on this. Um, that actually being able to deliver a lesson five days a week um, would be a much stronger model, um, given the fact that it would be online, uh, online backbone of that instruction. So the staff that is going to school for that pre-K through fourth is there five days a week? Yes. Yes. So that, I mean, eh, boy, a lot of, a lot of balls, a lot of balls in the air on this one. And, and so I hear what you're saying, Dave. Um, but, but there's a large group that also needs to be accommodated in, in the parents that, that, re, that have to work, that have dual income homes, that need uh, their kids in school because of this. And, and so, you know, two days on, two days off, three days on, three days off, it might not be ideal from a teaching point of view. Um, I think we're all on, on board with getting kids in the school for socializing reasons as well as face-to-face -face is good on any level. And I, I guess I would just um, challenge um, sort of thinking differently. And, and I know I don't, wanna, I don't want it to come off that you're not trying to think, think differently. We did, Susan mentioned how this is going to look different. And yet um, I feel in some areas we're trying to maintain normalcy, you know, keeping uh, the hallways clear so that the, the eighth graders can transition 
from uh, classroom to classroom is a reason not to send eighth graders back. Well, there's nothing that says they have to transition from classroom to classroom. I, I think if, if, if we're sending kids into school, then what must be true is that we feel confident that, um, that it's safe and that we've provided a, a safe environment for them. So if we've provided a safe environment for them, is there a way to provide that same safe environment for the rest of the, the school, um, but maybe differently? Maybe if the goal is to decrease the class sizes, we need to think about um, teaching up and teaching down uh, to staff appropriately. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. Teaching up and uh, teaching if, down. If, if we have a shortage, so many of our teachers are certified um, beyond their grade level. So. In a, in a way to, to um, you know, if we have a shortage of teachers in the middle school, uh, maybe there's a, a way where we can stagger uh, two days off or one week on or one week off or three days on, three days off, and the, the teaching staff can act as a, a sort of uh, a unit that can move across the groups uh, that are in the school at that time. I, I don't know how to say, I'll say this again, I don't know how to say this any differently. These are the assumptions that we've made based on the numbers that we have as we get real numbers, as we are allowed to get into the work of actually trying to see if this plan, or making this plan work, we will see if those numbers hold. Again, across the state, they, those numbers are down in many public school districts and we can make adjustments in terms of the numbers of students who we can bring in from there. And, and Nermina, to the question about an employee who contacted you, they really need to talk to HR, not the school board, about, about their particular situation and how we might help accommodate them. And I don't even think that it was more uh, anything in, in, in specific as far as that goes, but I think splitting up uh, the school plan, uh, it was really where people got hung up on. And uh, even um, Jocelyn that called in here earlier, who has two kids in, one at home, both parents working. If we're gonna do one or the other, I think we're better off almost going enriched virtual learning for everybody and giving a chance to some of those kids to go in um, at times, small groups for math or this, that or the other thing with special teachers. But I mean, it's just, I think it's having that split um, plan where it's difficult on a lot of people. Um, not, nothing personal to me, I, I suppose, because I have one child and whatever, he, whatever we decide to do here tonight for him uh, works for me one way or the other. But it's, you know, not everybody's in the same, obviously, uh, situation. And I get it. I mean, looking at the, at the chart from even last night's presentation, we have a heck of a lot more parents that are willing and feeling safe to, to send their kids to school, giving the current, I suppose, data on COVID. Uh, I see this just going more remote as we head into this cold flu COVID season. So we are eventually most likely going to end up there anyways. So I'm just trying to see it from, from that perspective on where we're going to end up and how we're going to try to do the best we can with the time we have that things are okay. Not great, but okay. I think the challenge is we don't know where we're going to end up, right? And so we're making some assumptions and we're, and we're planning for what could happen. Um, I guess, Bill, we've talked about this is in all the planning for what could happen, we're, we're, I'm, I'm concerned that we're sacrificing um, our first effort to, to get as many kids back into the school. If, if, if we deem it safe for some, then it's safe for all. And, and, from, and then it becomes a numbers game. And, you know, if we don't if we don't have the numbers, if we don't have enough teachers to cover to cover the numbers, then then um, really that's that's kind of where we're stuck at. And and do we do we talk about uh, uh, temporary employment for for additional staffing? We, we we going into COVID, we talked a lot about what kind of what funds do we have available and what do we need to do? Do we need to purchase more uh, online uh, computers? Do we need to purchase more iPads? Do we need to staff differently because of this? Um, and I know it's probably the last thing you want to hear right now at this point. I can't, yeah, I, I, there's a piece of that that there's a basis in that question that I can't get into publicly around numbers and those kinds of things at, at, at a particular school. So um, 
I, I think we've I think we've done that in terms of look at, looking at licensing. We spent quite a bit of time on people's licensing and the creativity that we have because of that licensing. And in terms of looking at the requests that we have and how they they work out. But but I've tried to illustrate that as best I can with with you all knowing that I can't discuss that pub, that piece of it publicly. Rick, can I jump in with a question? Yes, please. Is there a plan in place for students that are in the school to transition to remote learning if they end up in a quarantine situation or they can't attend? Can they transition to the remote learning academy seamlessly in that situation? David, you want to take that? Sure. Um, well, we've set the expectation in place, even in the face-to-face -face environment, um, that there's a there's a parallel. There needs to be a parallel. Um, online version of the class, or at least a remote uh, component of that class. And in your case, you know, it really it would really be an academic decision for the student, uh, you know, depending on how long term this would be, uh, whether or not it would be able to jump into a remote the remote academy, or to stick with the face to face. Uh, sorry, the remote component of the face to face class. Um, you know, I think I think that's going to have to be dealt with on an individual basis. But I think either either is possible. Okay, and then another question, uh, just based on the technology, I heard that the sixth through eighth graders are going to be issued uh, devices. And we talked earlier, uh, I think in the summer, about the school, making sure the school has enough capability and bandwidth for all the students to be doing this. Has that been assessed, and uh, are we where we need to be on that? Yeah, Jason's not here, but um, but that you're you're right about that. That was part of of the work with the technology directors to make sure that if we had teachers, I, I think the 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 sort of the measure they were using is if we were going to have teachers teach remotely from the building, that we had enough to push that out and 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 to come in. And I yes, I believe that assessment's been done in each of our buildings, and each of our buildings meet that standard now. Yes, and, and in terms of devices. We, um, we had a certain amount of money that was already in the budget for next year to purchase additional um, MacBooks for our middle school. And then we were purchasing um, a number of iPads with keyboards and we used our CARES grant money to purchase more of those. So we've positioned ourselves so that we feel like we have enough devices and we'd be able to deploy those um, to all of our students um, in different devices in different grade levels but the you know we, we have the most we have the newest devices available for five through eight hey. and, to, and to connect the two questions that you had martin um to speak with what susan was saying the um the students will be comfortable in their classrooms using these devices using these online tools for k to four and so if they do need to be out of school for um, a given time for quarantine, that they will have what they need to be able to stay with their current with their classes. Certainly the, um, the online learning academy would, could be an option, but um, the pacing could be different from the class. The tools used by the instructor could be different. So um, there's additional considerations there, but um, you know, we've, we've outfitted um, with technology uh, with this in mind. Right, and, and I, I just need to say that, you know, our case manager in grade two and three, uh, before COVID was already um, introducing certain uh, technology tools to help differentiate learning for students. So, you know, obviously that will continue to happen, but that was already part of our protocol. So that's, you know, that, that's an easy transition for us and, and for the students because students who needed certain technology, they, they were already getting used to using it. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, join in here. Um, so we're sending kids back K through fourth. So we basically feel we can keep our teachers safe. We know how to do that. Um, across the country, we know how to stop the spread. If people are safe, our doctors go back to work. They know how to keep themselves safe. They know how to um, wear the correct 
masks and, you know, all, all the necessary um, hand washing and hand sanitizing and everything that's going into reopening businesses and dentist offices and et cetera. Um, I can't leave this meeting tonight feeling that we can leave at least our fifth graders at home. I can't understand how a 10 year old is supposed to be left home by themselves. Um, so for me right now, I, we, we get to this standstill and everyone kind of, we stop talking for a second and we don't really know where we're going, but um, I, I think that highly needs to be reconsidered. I, I actually feel like it's criminal to say that a kid that's in fifth grade should be able to make their meals by themselves and be home by themselves and be teaching themselves throughout the day. Um, so if, if anything comes of any agreements that we come to tonight or I, I think we highly need to reconsider our fifth graders in um, leaving them out of this because there's a reason why middle school is sixth through eighth. They are still babies and they still need looking after. Well, um, oh, well middle school is sixth through eight in your district. I'll say that to start, okay? Because it's not that way everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and so well, let me finish. So I, I've said a couple times, the numbers may lead us there. The, the, the administration's given you an argument as to why the decisions were made in terms of numbers, in terms of those safety elements that you talked about earlier. And, and I said two or three times now that we will see if those are the numbers when we actually see who's returning, right? And because so losing fourth grade too? Is that what, if the numbers go the other way? Well, the numbers aren't gonna go the other way. We're not gonna end up with more students that we, than we ended last year with. That's not going to happen. Right. So what I'm saying is what we're seeing, not only in this state, but in other places, is that, the, is that numbers are down. Numbers are down because of homeschooling. Numbers are down because people are choosing other options. If those numbers of people and, and our numbers may be down because people choose the remote learning academy. If those numbers end up down in any of our districts, what we can do is reassess the plan to see if we have spaces, if we can create adequate um, social distancing to bring more kids in. Okay, so if a teacher can handle 10 kids in a pod and stay safe, couldn't they also handle a, a different section of 10 kids later in the day? If you were to shorten a day and bring fifth graders in, say that for- would, That would require transportation. Matt did the estimate on that. We gave that to you a couple months ago. That was about $7 million across the SAU, I believe the number was, to add a second round of transportation. So that we looked at that um, two months ago, that idea. So Dr. Lupini, and if you don't know, it's okay. But, so what is the number that if fifth grade um, goes to X, then, they would be in the building with K through four. I'm, I'm the wrong person. I, I will say this though, we, we, we have in some of our other schools because of the rooms available, we've made different assessments based on sizes of rooms, how we can configure them, what we have for furniture, those kinds of things. I think Susan gave you the general number earlier of 10 to 12 is that number, right? And so we may be able to bring in additional grade levels. I wanna be clear to Aaron's question. We, we may be able to bring in additional grade levels depending on where we get when we actually put out how many people are interested in the remote academy, how many people are sending back their children within, within these models. That's when we can come to you and say, you know, factors are gonna play out over the next two, three, four weeks. That's, that's a major one of them. And it may be possible to do more. It may be possible to do more. Um, so I thought it was more an issue of staffing and not so much how many kids do we have. We know we have 70, what was it, 68% of our parents have said that they would send. No, no, no you, we have. you don't know that. What you know is that's across the school. So we have a breakdown that we've looked at, right, roughly within grade spans and with individual grades. And, and you, you know this, that it's not 68% in every 
great. Yeah, That's right, of course. Yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. so we, we have some of those, those data. Um, we had much, for example, a school where we had much different data from one grade span to another was Southampton, where we had very low numbers in, 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 in the um, K to two range, and we could make some different observations based on those numbers, right? Um, what we know is how many students we ended the year with. What we know is roughly what we have within those grade spans, and that's what led to the recommendations. But again, we can expand upon those if, if we see that when we actually put out registration, I'll call it for lack of a better term, right, for the in-person in model, it could very well be that we can, that we can do more um, because, we, because we don't know. We know what we have from surveys, but, but what we've found I think I said this last night, what we know from those surveys is that, um, I mean, Andy gave you a number earlier of staff on the survey. That's three weeks removed from our survey and the numbers on some of those questions moved 18 points. So what we know is, is these numbers are changing whenever we've seen surveys, whenever we've done surveys. So we wanna capture hard numbers of who, who in this model, how many fourth graders do we have? How many third graders do we have? And then we can come back to you as we will in every district with adjustments from that. So when you're working on that number, you're working on the, the regular projection or are you working off of the data that's come in from fourth grade parent participants that say, I won't send my kid back or I will send my kid back? Yes, both. Yes, both. We're, working off the, we're working off that number, but since not everyone filled out the survey, we had decent yeah. responses, but we can extrapolate a guesstimate from that as to what that number might be. So and that's the number of income of students returning to school that you're basing your cohorts off of and then you're basing your staffing for those cohorts off of that. And, and, and we're looking at the, as I said last night, we're looking at the interaction between, between that staffing data that I have and these yeah. cohorts and seeing what we believe we can do when we, when we glom all those elements and, and, and try to figure out what's possible. Yes. Yeah. And, and can, I, can I ask a question about, um, sorry, Tom. No, 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 good. A question about the cohort number of a target 10 to 12 when a, when a single classroom teacher is teaching, um, you know, 15 to 20 kids, why is the cohort target um, that much lower? Because that's what allows for the social distancing that we're putting in place in those classrooms. And the social distancing is the six foot without masks or three foot with masks or what's the what's the model that we're using? We're using the March CDC and what's been recommended by the medical people we're talking to, which is six feet and masks. Six feet with masks. In the building. So so we run out we run out of space as well. Um well in as as Susan said, in many classrooms we we can we can make that work. Um they described earlier the, uh, the the issue in fourth and fifth grade, right? So and so, just so you know, I mean, really, the efforts are there. I mean, we we're you know we've got we're, we're measuring. We're um, you know we're going to be asking teachers to to figure out what's furniture that they don't need that we can store so that they can make more space to you know have kids seating available. We're probably going to take rugs out and you know that that kind of group meeting area doesn't need to have the rug because that's those are germ you know germ magnets and you know we'll probably take some of those things out and then when they do have meetings they'll have to pull chairs over and, and things like that so so you know there really are a lot of things we've thought about to try to maximize the space um and and you know figure out how we can how we can do this safely because that's really the you know that that's that, that's the key thing, just just like Becca said. It's like that feeling of safety and belonging that we really we we really have to make sure that we that we um, that, that everybody's comfortable, um, including our teachers. So it's it's just it's it's just a challenge and, and we are committed to to getting as many kids back as we can. And just like Bill said, if if you know if the remote academy draws numbers of kids to to, to lower that cohort size so that we feel it's safe then we absolutely will make that recommendation. And I don't know when the next um, time the board's scheduled to meet, but you know. Well, we, we I mean, we'd, make the, we'd need to make those adjustments and boards okay. will need to be flexible because we, I mean, one of the things we said last night is the one thing we know about the plan we put forward is it will, it will change over yeah. the next five weeks. Yeah, so the other part is, so, and it's, 
it's great that we're talking about how many families are going to choose remote learning academy and what will our enrollment be and that certainly is a part of the cohort size the other part that um, we need to help you get to is um, how many of our teachers are going to request accommodations because of what's happening in other districts and what's going on so we know what our staffing is right so it's a it's a it's enrollment and it's staffing and they both need to come together we need to figure that out yes it's all those factors yes yeah so that's yet that's an unknown entity we have we have a number of of teachers who are not not coming back due to their choice and then we have a number of teachers who are who are going to um be held to a decision based on what their children's districts say we have a number of teachers who've, in, who've indicated the possible or definite need for some sorts of accommodations under the laws that we talked about last night because of their own health conditions, the health conditions of people in their home um, or, their, or, the, or their child care issues, largely in those three buckets. Yes. I'm not sure that it, when I read the guidelines, that it seems to be six feet and masks. I'm happy, we have Dr. Guidi here, who's one of our, one of the people we've been working with. I'm, I, I said to Greg earlier, I'm happy to bring him, him in for this discussion, if, you, if that's what you'd like. I'm not a medical expert. I'm not, I'm not going to try to um, talk about that. I don't, I don't want to push making anyone uncomfortable, but to say that, you know, that's the recommendation. I just, I, I ha, I'm, I'm not necessarily maybe reading it the same way, um, but to say that we can't bring our students in to a building because other kids get to be six feet away and masked and we're going to sacrifice older children for that and, and, and their education. I, 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 that's not what I said. I, That's not what I said, and, and I, 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 I wish you'd rephrase that. I'm not trying. I'm not saying that we're sacrificing. I'm not trying to you say. Do that. I, I, I apologize. I'm just trying to think that maybe there's room for bringing more students in if we're being overly. Um, um, it doesn't if, appear to be a, a room issue. I, I think. From what I heard is that the accommodations to, to, to accommodate the six foot rule or guideline is, is being able to be accommodated through these grades. It, it sounds more uh, to me that, that um, between the variable of, of the, the, the staff that hasn't yet been able to make a decision because they're hanging in, the, in air and then the staff that has cons health concerns uh, that have already uh, let it be known you know that that's a large variable that that can really affect that can really affect um, the other grades. It doesn't appear, Susan. I might be mishearing it, but it didn't appear that space is a concern. There's cafeteria. There's a gymnasium. You've got two tents out back. I, I felt like space was fine. We have space, but I will say it's a concern for the middle school grades because um, those are the largest class sizes, and um, you know to put to put middle schoolers in the cafeteria without their, you know, without their teacher and with someone who's not providing instruction doesn't feel like it's educationally sound to us. So, so we have space to spread out, but, um, but it, it is just like we said, it's that intersection of appropriate staffing, um, cohort size and space. I think it really is very much about the interaction of those elements. I don't think, I don't, I don't think it's, it's any, I don't think it's any one of them. Um, I, I think it's the intersection of those elements. So, so we, we clearly need to figure out a way to get you the um, access to continue the work. Um, I get that. I think there's a couple of pieces that I, I'd like to see if we can't add in to get you to think about as, and I know you're already thinking about it, so I, I didn't mean to say it in a, in a, in a jerky way. Um, but things like, well, it may not be sound to have kids in a cafeteria um, without their teacher. It may be better to have a kid in a cafeteria with high-speed internet access with adult supervision rather than being at home alone as a fifth grader, right? Um, 
So trying to figure out if there's some ways we can support families and students, even if they're remote learning on campus, um, trying to figure out if there's a way to get uh, fifth graders um, as part of the K through four cohort. And then <clears throat> over time, trying to figure out if there's a way, once we have all the data, to rotate and have a hybrid model for uh, middle school six, seven, eight. Um, so that some kids are in some days, right? All we need to get those data that you're asking for in that second element is your authorization of a plan so that we can see the number of kids we have. Yep. So how do we, Matt, I might lean on you for this. How do we um, frame a motion that lets you go forward um, and, and do what you need to do, knowing that there may be a baseline recommendation, but that we're looking to expand beyond the baseline recommendation once you have the data that you need to, to set that, to make that evaluation? Well, I think, <laughs> so the, <laughs> so I think, I think any, any recommendation to proceed with the proposal is with the understanding that this is going to change. So it's, it, it's approval for this, um, you know, for this to, to proceed with this plan, knowing that it's, 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 it's the plan is going to change within, you know, it, it's an iterative process. So, um, I, I think, it, I think it's simply approving the plan, knowing that we're, we're, we're coming back with something different, you know, in, in the near future. I mean, Tom, it could be as simple as approval of the plan and ask us to report back on the feasibility of, of expanding beyond the K to four model and in person in, in, in two weeks, I would think we'll have some beginnings of those data within two weeks. Yeah, I think I would be comfortable with that as well. All right. I know it's, I know it's the intention, um, but maybe it's the intention yeah. that we need to add in. So, um, so let me make, let me see if I can make that motion. Um, I'd like to make a motion, Greg. I'd like to make a motion to approve the plan, uh, proposed plan as presented with the recommendation that the SAU and administration um, provide additional options after they have the data that they need to understand staffing um, and enrollment. With an eye toward, ex toward expanding beyond K to four, uh, pre-K right. to four? We, we, exactly, yeah. thank you. With an eye towards expanding beyond K to four and providing uh, students access, remote learning students access to the school. Well, that, that's part of the plan. Okay, gotcha. That's actually part of the plan, so. Yeah. Yep. Do we need to re rewrite that and read it again? Did you get that, Rhonda? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, working, I'm working on it, but you know, kind of went all over the place, so. Sideways, so I'd like to make um, a motion to approve the plan as recommended. The request that the SAU and administration report back to the board um, okay, wait a minute. It, it just went out again. Okay. It right. went sideways again. What I had so far, Tom, motion to approve the proposed plan as presented with the recommendation that the SAU administration provide additional options to understand. You froze. Uh, but to, to expand in school learning beyond K through four. To, options to expand in school learning. Oh boy. Oh, Rhonda froze? That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. That's not good because she's the host. Thank God you're the co host, Susan. <laughs> Next man up. <laughs> You, do you really want me to like try to type it? I can't. She has to do it. We're gonna have to let her come back in. Yeah. Right here, so, Tom. Can I make an amendment to your amendment? Oh, that please. A, yes. Yes. A, a, a request. A request from the yeah, school. A request. request. You're right. You're right. Yes. Thank you. So if you say it again, I can type it in the message. You want me to type it in the message, and then she'll have it. Looks like she just bailed and is going to try to re yeah. She'll come back in. Right, but if you, do you want me to type it in there or you just wait for her? She got it. Okay. 
unless she's lost her internet access. It says she, it's reloading. I just got a text from her, so. She did all that typing, Susan. I don't want you to have to do rework. She just texted me, Susan is co-host, so there you Hi. go. <laughs> so, so Susan, you want me to try, want to try this again, do it the right way? Yeah. I would like to uh, make a motion to approve the recommendation as presented with the request that the SAU and administration report back the feasibility of expanding in-school learning beyond K through four. Is everybody there? Yes, hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh my goodness. Greg, okay. I, I so think we're, oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you wanna attach a timeline to that request? Yeah, 72 hours. I'm just kidding. Where? <laughs> uh, Dr. Lupini, do you say you'd have the information in like two weeks? Is that what you said? Um, what is tomorrow? Seventh? Or seventh. Yeah, I, yeah, I would guess by the, uh, I mean, we have to. Right. On the 21st, we, we, we have to. So who, who, did somebody write down this motion? I just, here, I just wrote it in, how do I get it to go? Let me see. If you, oh, okay. There it is. Oh, I guess I Recommendation can. as presented. Let me see, I wonder if I can. I don't know if it'll let me and paste that into board docs. Yeah, why not? I'm going to try. And then, Dr. Lupini, is there anything that we need to do to give you authority to expand so, the, um, the idea that you had about teachers bringing students into our district? Tom, before you go there, I'm going to ask for a second to the motion, oh. and then we can open it up for further discussion. Sorry, that's right. Thank you. We have a second. I'll second that. I got it. And so Martin is seconding that? Yes. Okay. So Tom, some further discussion. Yeah, so thank you. Is there anything that we need to, to do to um, get you to give you the authority to, to explore the can students from other districts come here if it helps out? So it, it's complicated, right? Because what we would have to do within these parameters that we've talked about is identify seats throughout all the districts. Um, and that's what makes it complicated in a five district SAU. I think if you, I think, um, cause I have talked to um, a chair or two in other districts about the ideas. They, they called me, said, did you talk about this two weeks ago? Um, so um, I think if you, if, if you were inclined to express support for the idea, if, if a number of our districts did that, then it would become a tool that we could, that we could utilize in trying to help um, to trying to help utilize it as an accommodate, as a potential accommodation for people, if that makes sense. Did that make sense? Yep. Oh, so good. I'm only one person, but I'd be inclined to explore that. I don't know why the rest of the board feels. I make a quick comment on that. I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. It's something a creative idea, but to bring in kids from other districts into our school before we have all of our students back, I think is. Uh, that's uh, kind of a tough one to uh, to get past having other kids there before all of our our kids are in the school. So, hundred percent. But what it would do is that I would actually help us get there faster because it would free up staffing so that we could get our, all of our kids back. It's so Martin, it wouldn't just be your district; it would be other districts where we were under the number of students and only in the grades that we were bringing in, right? So it. So you're you're right in that. A sixth grader in your district or a seventh grader in your district might still be out, but bringing in, you know, Hampton Falls, for example, agreeing to bring in a third grader might get another teacher back for you. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I think it's definitely worth exploring. I just think it's, uh, it's tough to get past having other kids in our school, but if we can make the numbers work, like Tom said, that it brings more kids into our school, it's definitely worth exploring. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I agree. I think you know, Martin, to Martin's point, it's bad optics for the for the for the few. It's it's a it's, it's definitely a community based. You know, the ability to get a teacher back into the school helps our community, and, and so it, there's a give and take there. And for some, it might look really bad. There, I, I would expect some you know pushback on that. Um, but I think we have, we're trying to think for the greater good here, um, for sure. Definitely open to it. Definitely, definitely worth exploring. I just, just worried about that one, that one concern that Absolutely. pops up immediately. Yeah, I, I agree, Martin. I may not have an issue with that myself, uh, if it means bringing more teachers in, but I just have a really tough time with uh, the idea that we are not doing uh, the same thing for our all our kids. It's kind of really tough to 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 swallow and and vote on um, trying to take out so much. Um, so I wish we could have come up with a solution where we gave kids a chance um, in each grade level, but it doesn't look like we're gonna get there. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got numbers problems. Um, yeah. And so yeah. the, the, the chance that, that we're forced it, you know, the chance you speak of that we're forced into right now is, is not no education. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a remote education right now. And, and I think in two weeks we will be looking at, I hope in two weeks we'll be looking at some other numbers and we can, we can make this an evolving model as uh, Dr. Lupini um, has, uh, has alluded to. Is, this might not be something we're allowed to talk about or something that um, we, we've gone down that path already, but is there the ability to hire more staff if that's where we need to go? Uh, I'm sorry, if that's where, what do you mean by if that's where we need to go? I, I wanna make like, sure. If, if that's a means of getting our kids into the building is looking to hire um, like, like substitutes, something that we could do. Okay, thanks for, yeah. So, um, so we were, as we discussed last night, um, we're worried about our substitute numbers. Yep. Um, they're down. Um, we're doing some things to try to add to those roles, but they're, they're down considerably. We're hearing that across the Southeast that um, many subs are dropping off of, of lists. So that's a, that's a concern for us. Um, you know, it would, it, it's a, it's <laughs> to go back to, to Tom's sort of explanation of the wall. There are certain, potential, if, if, you, if you can't come up with a reasonable accommodation for someone that allows them to keep working, there are certain payouts. Um, they can collect certain amounts of money over a certain period of time, okay? So it's really about how much money you end up paying out in terms of them losing sick leave or those kinds of things versus then your ability to bring in uh, essentially a replacement on salary schedule for them and how much of that, Matt, Matt will correct me on all of this, by the way, it's about how much of that your budget can support. Right. It's all additional. Money. How'd I do, Matt? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's pretty accurate. Um, I mean, bottom line is we didn't budget for extra teachers. So, I mean, we don't, we don't currently have those funds. Um, is it, you know, It'd be difficult to, to find additional funding um, for additional teachers. That that's, I mean, that's not something that we've um, that that is really feasible at this point. Mm -hmm. well, and and uh, it's not only the budget; it's finding teachers and getting them assimilated in the next five weeks. That's right. Yeah, we're really late. Well, I also just feel like we are at, a, um, it, obviously everyone is affected across the way and we are going to have a lot of college students, a lot of college students that are, you know, maybe close to degrees that are at home looking for jobs. They're going online. Um, having that as a resource is, is, could be very valuable. That's true. That's absolutely true. It's, it's, uh, we talked about that actually with Mr. Saltmarsh. Um, because of, uh, of a situation involving his family in college and how there are going to be uh, more kids in their communities um, 
uh, taking online courses, those kinds of things, and not going back to campus, and there is an opportunity to potentially add to substitute roles there. Yes, it's a good point. So maybe um, looking to waive some sort of certifications in some way, or um, you know, we but going like an alternative route where, you know, there are people that have a lot of credits and it might not be education, but it could go towards. Sure. That isn't no, I mean, you're describing two different people now that there's college students who might be our subs. And then there, then there are people who you're talking about who may be able to go alternative routes and whatever, but much of that still goes back to what Mr. Farrar said. And that is the budget to support them. Well, I personally think it's like one of the most important things that our money could go towards is getting these yeah, kids back. We don't, we don't disagree with that at all. We have a budget for substitute teachers. We have a budget for a position teaching. I I right. And if we have to pay certain amounts out off of that, you know, we, we one of our responsibilities is to help you Meet, meet that budget in creative ways and we will we will do that but we were just merely trying to lay out the challenges within that um, if, if we have these kind of situations which again what we're trying to do is come up with strategies to avoid those situations and make it so that your teachers can teach that's our end goal want to take a vote any further discussion we have a motion and a second on the table are we ready to vote? Aaron Stanton? Aaron Stanton? I feel like I really don't have any choice there. Um, I, have to, I have to say yes for the K through fourth kids. So yes. Greg Duffy? Yes. Martin Tavishian? Yes. Nermina Peterson? No. And Tom Von Jess? Yes. I have the vote recorded. Thank you, Rhonda. Great. All right, next. Uh, yeah, Tom. One last thing on this, and then we're done. Um, because it came up from a couple parents in the past, and I know it's part of the plan. But it might be um, really great, Susan, if over the next uh, couple weeks we could get something out to the community about what the enriched remote learning looks like and how it's different than it was during crisis learning, um, that might help to uh, allay some concerns. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, we can, we can do that. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, under new business school board audit questionnaire. This is something that we do every year. I can't remember, Matt, if you did the reading or if James had to read it. I think you have to read this. Yeah, I have the pleasure. Um, so, as, so as part of the annual audit process, um, we, we do the, our auditor, Plodzik and Sanderson, um, does ask that the board members um, answer some questions um, in regard to um, financial controls. Um, so I'm gonna go through a list of questions and ask that the board answer. Um, so the first question is, do you have any knowledge or suspicions of fraud affecting your entity? No. No. Have you received any communications from employees, former employees, regulators, or others alleging fraud? No. No. Have you identified any specific risks of fraud within your entity? No. No. Has the board adopted a universal code of ethics for members and employees to follow? Um, and, and we do have a copy of, of that um, code for you. Yes. 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 So if yes, does this document prohibit elected officials and employees from doing business with the entity? Yes. Yes. Have you or any related party of yours had any interest, direct or indirect, in any of the following transactions or pending or incomplete transactions since July 1st, 2019, to which the school district SAU or any retirement, savings, pension, or other similar plan was or is to be a party? The first item is the sale, purchase, exchange, or leasing of property. No. 
Receiving or furnishing of goods, services, or facilities? No. No. Transfer or receipt of income or assets? No. No. Maintenance of bank balances or compensating balances for the benefit of another? No. No. Other transactions? Nope. All right, does the board formally authorize all disbursements, both the vendor and payroll, prior to the release of funds? Yep. Yes. Describe how the board stays informed of the latest changes in the laws and regulations pertaining to the entity. So typically, we um, will update the board um, um, via the superintendent and the SAU office. Um, however, if, if please elaborate on that if, if that's not how you feel. No, you tell us. All right. Um, does the board review um, comparative reports of estimated actual revenues and appropriations and expenditures? Yes, every month. What procedures does the board follow in reviewing or using these reports? For example, does the board normally meet with the department heads as part of this process? Also, does the board review both the re revenue and expenditure reports? Yes. Revenue and expenditure reports are reviewed monthly at our board meetings by the business administrator. So we'll review the, um, so for example, later this in this meeting, we'll be reviewing the expenditure um, report. Um, the first month, um, there's not an, a revenue report as there's, there really is no revenue to be reported um, early in the fiscal year. Um, has the board approved a disaster recovery plan in the event of a loss or interruption of the IT function? We can say yes now. It is a yes now, and we, and we do have a copy. Um, is there a written investment policy adopted? Yep. Yes. And that was last um, reviewed and approved on October 22nd of 2019. Have you adopted the use of either debit or credit cards by employees? Yep. Yes. Does the board have knowledge of any funds or bank accounts that are not in the custody of the treasurer? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And those two accounts are the student activity funds, which are managed by um, the principal, Susan Snyder, as well as our, the expendable trust funds, which are managed by the North Hampton trustees of the trust funds. Has the board approved a fund po balance policy in compliance with GASB? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Does the school district SAU, SAU have knowledge of any crowdfunding activities? If so, please indicate what they are on what website they are maintained and who is responsible for them? No knowledge. Okay. Since the World Health Organization's declaration of the worldwide pandemic due to coronavirus COVID-19, how has the board adopted, adapted to, make, to making financial decisions, reviewing budget versus actual reports, and approving vendor and payroll manifests? Um, so I'll, I'll just summarize kind of the actions that we've taken. Um, so we have um, transitioned all board meetings to a Zoom format. Um, all financial reports are um, provided and uploaded on board docs for review. Um, additionally, all our manifests, that includes payroll and accounts payable, um, are reviewed and um, approved via DocuSign electronic signature. Um, is there any additional information that the board would like to add? this time. All right. Um, so I will complete, um, fill in the remainder of this form and submit it to the um, board chair um, via DocuSign for um, review and approval. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next item on our agenda is extra extracurricular stipends committee recommendations. Yes. So, um, so per the 2019 to 2023 um, collective bargaining agreement with our um, with our teachers union um, C, um, an extracurricular um, stipend committee um, is formed on an annual basis. And the purpose of this committee is to review um, our current extracurricular stipends and then make any recommendations to the school board for adjustments. Um, this committee did um, convene. Um, this consisted of um, a number of our um, of our Northampton teachers, um, as well as board members and administration. Um, upon completion of that committee, we um, the committee is recommending that the school board approve 
renaming the field hockey stipend to a flex athletic stipend. And this will allow the flexibility and, and, and ability to offer different sports um, based on, on student participation and need. Um, oftentimes from a year to year basis, um, there may be um, a, a, a desire or par participation levels um, for different sports um, at Northampton. So we're, we're just looking for the flexibility to adjust that stipend um, um, accordingly. Um, further, the committee recommends renaming the Games Club stipend to, to Academics Club. Um, and examples of those would be the Geo Challenge, Spelling Bee, D&D, &D, and Coder Z. Um, and this will also allow for that um, similar flexibility um, based on student participation and need. Um, these adjustments require no additional funding or cost to the school district. I'd like to make a motion to accept the extracurricular stipends committee recommendations. Second. I gotta be able to mute you, Aaron, myself. <laughs> Are we ready for the vote? Yep. Aaron Stanton? Yes. Greg Duffy? Yes. Martin Tavishian? Yes. Hermina Peterson? Yes. And Tom Bunjess? Yes. Vote has been recorded. Thank you, Rhonda. Next item is our financial report. So the um, so I haven't included the um, year to date um, expenditure report. Um, obviously, we are only um, a month into the to the fiscal year, so um, we, there's um, there are not there there are not a great deal of expenditures to date. Um, I'll also point out that. Um, you'll see many of the salary accounts, um, you know, have, have not been expended or have no allocation at all. Um, that's because um, a good deal of our staff do not start um, until the end of August and September. So that payroll encumbrance has not been included. Um, you know, there, I do want to know a few accounts that, um, that are overexpended, um, one of which is our professional services account for special education, which is um, you know, th that's a large encumbrance, um, but we are slightly over by just over $1,000. Um, this, this account is for our, our contracted services. So, you know, um, you know, our, our psychologist or PT, OT, those type of related, related services. Um, additionally, um, if, you go, if you go to page um, three, um, you'll see our computer instruction equipment account is over budget by $2,000 just over $2,000. Um, and this reflects some of that um, extra um, spending that we, um, that we invested in for our um, additional devices and laptops um, for, um, you know, for this remote um, environment or potential remote environments. Um, on page number um, five, you'll see under the buildings accounts um, equipment, um, we're over budget by, um, you know, just over $27,000. Um, and this is primarily due um, to the rental of our, uh, of the tents um, that are being erected um, for the outdoor classrooms um, for, for the first two months of the year. Um, otherwise, um, you know, like I said, um, you know, most of, most of our accounts are, have, have very little um, expenditures. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions though um, that you may have. Any other questions on financial report? Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Matt. Okay, next, uh, ratification of nominations for the personnel. Is that a, did we do that non-public then? Yeah, sorry, Bill. Yes, we need a non-public. I'd like to make a motion to go into non-public, right? Do we have to do that? Uh, let me just we'll check the agenda. We have resignations that will go under uh, non-public as well. Um, there's also three dates on there, um, as well as uh, new dates. I think that will be added shortly. Um, so, uh, I would like to 
possibly ask Bill questions. We're going into non-public. Tom's about to make the motion. I see the motion is made under B. I was wondering if we could also add C to that so we can open up our discussion under non-public with some more specific questions. I'm sorry, I don't have those in front of me, so I don't know what C is. I'm sorry. So C is uh, um, matters which if discussed in public would likely adversely affect the reputation of any person other than a member of the body or agency itself. Sure. I, I, in, uh, uh, yes. So I'd like to make a motion to enter non-public session under RSA 91A32 B and C. Yep. We need a roll call. Roger, you're mute. Aaron? Yes. Greg? Yes. Hermina? Yes. Tom? Yes. And Martin is not present, so okay. I have this recorded. Um, uh, before we leave, I just like to, because uh, I know we still have an audience. Martin Tavishan is a Northampton uh, fire and rescue worker, and he was on call tonight, so there was always the possibility that he might have to drop off. And so, uh, ultimately, that's what happened. Just so anyone viewing uh, knows. Thank you. So I'm not sure if Dave talked to you about how we're going to do the non-public since we have so many um, people in the audience. No, I didn't. So rather than actually inviting them all in and putting them on a hold, what I've done is just invited you guys to a separate Zoom meeting. It'll pop up on your email. Um, so I would ask this group, the panelists, to leave this meeting and join the non-public meeting. Rhonda's going to keep this meeting open for the attendees, and then we can all just jump back on after non-public. Uh -huh on our SAU email? Yes, it is. All right. Yeah, wicked you right there. I'm going to I'm just going to hang out with you guys. I think you're supposed to go to the other one. Dang it. <laughs> and All right, and before we move over, I had to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Recording. <laughs> I wouldn't show our hands. <laughs> I have Aaron making a motion to resume the public meeting. Do I have a second on that? Second. Aaron? For voting? Aaron? Yes. Craig? Yes. Martin? Yes. Hermina? Yes. And Tom? Yes. Okay, that vote's recorded. All right. Yours, Tom. I'd like to make a motion to approve the nomination of April Levesque for the position of occupational therapist. Second. Aaron? Yes. Greg? Yes. Martin? I'll have to abstain after missing the non public. Nermina? Yes. And Tom? Yes. That vote is recorded. I'd like to make a motion to approve the resignation of Tracy Griffin Hagen with appreciation and regret. I'll reluctantly second. That was Tom and Greg and Aaron. Yes. Greg. Yes. Martin? I'll have to abstain. Nermina? Yes. And Tom? Yes. <clears throat> that vote is recorded. I would like to make a um, motion to accept the resignation of Anna Spaulding, continued upon filling her position. Second. And Aaron? Yes. Greg? Yep. Martin? Abstain. Nermina? Yes. 
And Tom. Yes. Those votes are recorded. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> you beat me. Is unanimous? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Night. Thank you. Night. 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 All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.